dear colleagues, uh, could you please take your seat? And we will start with our union symposium, which is called From Fundamental Atmospheric Composition Research to Societal Services. And this symposium is dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Global Atmosphere Watch Program of the World Meteorological Organization. Our, to give you some background on our program, we prepared some outreach materials so you can take a look at them. They are on the table here. Our, you can see the announcement of the splinter meeting, which we have in addition to the symposium, which will take place tomorrow. And I think at this point we can start. And we can start with the storytelling. Uh, as you know, the Talano Dialogue. Long, long ago, in 1970, the World Meteorological Organization organized the first environmental day. And that day started the era of the environmental observations and research, which we are continuing up to now. Uh, from 1970, our, the World Meteorological Organization Executive Council defined the background air pollution monitoring network which started observing critical for that time are parameters related to precipitation chemistry, aerosol, uh, optical depth and aerosol burden, as well as carbon dioxide. And in 1976, the Global Ozone uh, Research and Monitoring Project was also established by the World Meteorological Organization. Since that time, our WMO continues its efforts in the monitoring analysis of atmospheric chemical composition. Our, in 1978, the research and monitoring project was approved on carbon dioxide, and the first carbon dioxide conference took place in 1980. So we are not the first day in business. We've been doing it for many, many years. And uh, in 1989, the Global Atmosphere Watch Program was formed to reinforce the integration of observation, to reinforce the science and research, and to look at what kind of services the science at the international level can provide to society. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, who is taking the burden of running this big, big program, which is really big, the chair of our scientific steering committee, Professor Greg Carmichael. Our, he has a PhD in chemical engineering and he has done extensive research related to air quality and its environmental impacts. He is currently the professor of chemical and biogeochemical engineering at University of Iowa. He also serves as a co-director of the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, a large interdisciplinary center with about 100 faculty. He is a leader in the development and application of chemical transport model, scaling from the local to the global scale. He has over 350 journal publications, and the majority of his recent papers deal with the development and application of chemical transport models to, uh, to studies in regional atmospheric chemistry, air quality, and climate. His studies have led to a greater appreciation and understanding of importance of long-range transport of pollutants within Asia and across the Pacific. His work has also explored the importance of dust on atmospheric chemistry and has helped to simulate laboratory as well as large-scale field experiments. Most recent, his work was focused on the role of black carbon in atmosphere and its dual role as a pollutant and climate warming agent. He is an active instructor and advisor. He has supervised uh, 45 PhD students. Uh, among his students, he also has the Minister of Environment, the former Minister of Environment of Chile. Craig, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Oksana. Uh, certainly, it's a great opportunity, and thank you all for being here to help us uh, celebrate the, the 30th birthday of the Global Atmospheric Watch Program. And uh, as a community working uh, to foster atmospheric chemistry research and see its application to a variety of service. And I'm very excited because I think at uh, the times we live now, atmospheric composition matters. It matters more today than it did in the past, 
and it's going to matter more in the future. I'm going to take the next uh, few minutes to, to, to talk about uh, atmospheric chemistry research uh, in general, but uh, I'll talk about the Global Atmospheric Watch program and where we're at and, and where we're headed. Certainly, uh, I think everyone in the room, room understands that uh, many of our uh, uh, important problems facing society today uh, deal with atmospheric composition uh, and uh, its interaction with uh, uh, ecosystems, human health, uh, weather, and climate. Uh, you can see the important problems that have, we've been facing for many years and will continue to face these in the future. If we take a look and see what's happening with atmospheric composition, certainly it's important to air quality, it's important to weather, it's important to climate, but if you look at some of the um, forcing, where we're headed, uh, there's clearly uh, a closer linkage to weather, atmospheric composition, and climate-related services. We're appreciating the understanding of the linkages of these problems and the need to uh, address these problems. So, so society is, uh, uh, its interest and needs are, are leading us to this closer integration. Society is interested in this information. It's needed at higher resolution, at longer forecast times, and this is the information that society is demanding. So from the research perspective uh, to the uh, service delivery perspectives, uh, you'll see this happening. Higher resolution models, longer lead times. How can we provide this uh, to meet society needs? So. And it's clear that further improvements in predictions are, require advances in observing systems, models, and the ability to optimally combine the information available to us. We have a lot of information that's still limited in this complex process of, of the Earth system. So how can we uh, optimally combine the observations and the models? Uh, it's not simply enough. We'll never have the capacity to totally observe the system, and models uh, are far from having a total predictive skill. So it's these two together that are extremely important. When we look at uh, uh, research, we can look at, uh, you know, this is a study that's now about four or five years old. National Academy of Sciences looked at the future of atmospheric chemistry research. But I think this vision is shared by many uh, uh, studies uh, across the, uh, uh, you know, in different countries and regions. Um, this idea of the importance of atmospheric composition research, in the middle, you can see the, we need to be able to link the understanding between emissions. But also, you can see the far two panels in terms of issues of uh, society uh, relevance, human health, ecosystems, weather and climate, and the demands for society, of why this is important. And one of the goals of atmospheric uh, research is to increase our understanding. And one way that we can express this understanding is to put it into a predictive capability. And so this report, and, and certainly others, this need to connect sources to impacts requires us to improve the predictability. So that's an overarching uh, goal from atmospheric chemistry, to translate that knowledge into predictability. And this view is shared broadly by the, our community. In our community, uh, in this room, uh, wears many hats, certainly. Um, we're here to wave the Global Atmospheric Watch uh, flag, but certainly IGAC and SPARC and other uh, organizations, uh, uh, we share commonalities and a common community and, and common interest in seeing atmospheric chemistry research applied for the betterment of society. Oksana mentioned briefly uh, in the introduction, but I want to just pause that the Global Atmospheric Watch program has had a long uh, history you know, dating back, uh, she mentioned uh, Earth Day in, uh, in 1970s, but formally established in 1989. And it combined the existing global ozone observing system, which was established in 1957 with, the international, with one of the international geophysical years. There was already in the 60s a background air pollution monitoring net network called BATMON um, that was already in operation. Um, and you know, all of this happened in 1980s because of this kind of convergence of, of awareness in environmental issues of various scales. And so it's just a collection of cartoons everywhere from urban air pollution, acid rain, the ozone hole, and the, the notions of uh, anthropogenic uh, perturbation 
uh, of the climate system uh, from the nuclear winter sort of perspective to a cold earth to the global warming perspective. So these, uh, these issues were converging at this time and so the Global Atmospheric Watch uh, came into existence at that time. And if you think of the power of, of people working together under a UN organization, you can look at this map. Uh, the uh, IO3C uh, 1933, at that point in time, there were uh, less than 12 stations uh, for monitoring ozone worldwide. Then uh, uh, coming together under the Global Atmospheric Watch Program and others, we're now uh, uh, more than uh, 100 stations. And so this power of coming together, having an express vision, a common interest and a need from society to, to better understand these systems uh, can lead to uh, powerful outcomes. And all along the way, obviously, these are organizations, but it takes people to make things happen. And so on the left, you'll see this um, first uh, EC commission that was uh, thinking about and led to the organization of the formal Global Atmospheric Watch. Uh, you can look at some of the names there. And then on the right, you can see uh, the secretariat uh, at uh, shortly after that time. And, and certainly, I want to call attention to John Miller and the role that he played in, uh, in uh, leading formally uh, the evolution and the establishment of the Global Atmospheric Watch Program. <clears throat> So uh, again, uh, as uh, Oksana said, uh, the, we've been in business for a while and our roots are, are deep. And let, I'll take the next few minutes to talk about uh, where we're at in the Global Atmospheric Watch program. We provide uh, in international leadership in research and capacity development, and atmospheric composition observations and analysis. And our forefront has been the establishment of observations and observations for the long term maintaining and applying long-term systematic observations of chemical composition and related physical characteristics of the atmosphere. From the beginning, the focus is on emphasizing quality assurance and quality control. And the notion was, if we're going to need a long-term record to understand what we're doing to Earth, both from uh, kind of our impact and also our attempts to improve the situation, we need long-term record and we need to be able to put on the same curve and the same uh, uh, observations from different sources. So we need to be able to control and understand the quality of those observations. And uh, from the beginning, we've been very focused on uh, using that data to deliver integrated products and services related to atmospheric composition of relevance to users. And again, uh, the Global Atmospheric Watch builds on partnerships. You know, it's certainly not just the weather services, but it's this entire community represented by many of you in this room and many more. Uh, we have a, a large number of people who are contributing significantly to the Global Atmospheric Watch program, and they're from more than 100 countries. So, and uh, much of the GAO program, the Global Atmospheric Watch program, uh, is contributed from the research community and its various constituents. Our most recent activity, we, we uh, established our current uh, implementation plan in year 2016, so we're about in the middle of this uh, implementation plan. And it derives from uh, research driving uh, atmospheric uh, composition. But within the WMO context, we're interested in translating this uh, uh, information into understanding and, in the broadest sense, uh, services. So when we established this implementation plan, the vision for this decade, if you will, of the Global Atmospheric Pro Program is to grow the international network of high quality observations across local to global scales. So when we began, it was mostly a global picture, but now much of the action that society demands, it, uh, we need to understand what's happening locally as well as globally. To drive high quality and impact science while co-producing a new generation of research-enabled products and services. And so our program is, is uh, research, but with the application of that research, the translation of that research, just like uh, in the medical world, the translation of basic medical research to the bedside to impact, so translational medicine, this notion of translational atmospheric chemistry, if you will, uh, taking what we know to, to provide 
research-enabled uh, services to society. And so that was uh, an increased emphasis in our current uh, implementation plan. So the elements of the Global Atmospheric Watch program today are shown here. Um, again, observations uh, drive and are at the core of the program. Quality remains uh, uh, at the core of the program. We're known for quality. It requires data management. But more and more, the modeling and analysis of those observations is a growingly important uh, focus. The implementation plan outlines many joint research activities. Uh, but in any of uh, research, uh, atmospheric chemistry research that we're talking about here, research cannot continue without uh, paying attention to capacity building, the need for the next generation of scientists everywhere in the world to be empowered with the capability to continue to study atmospheric uh, composition and relate it to society uh, impacts and benefits. Uh, and also, uh, science and research uh, requires uh, uh, outreach and communications, uh, uh, and that's, these are all important elements of the Global Atmospheric Watch program. If we take a snapshot today of the op observational infrastructure, we have a Gauss's program where you can look at that, and if you think back to where we started with that ozone map, uh, you know, back in 1951, we now have a lot more measurements in many parts of the world, uh, and so there continues to be this advancement from the community the value and the need for and the continued articulation for the need for high quality measurements, again from local to global scale. The Gauss stations that you see here are often comprised of uh, rather complicated uh, research infrastructure. You know, many of them are with MET services, but, but many of them are not. Uh, they're belonging to research institutes or, or universities or other institutions. Uh, and many of uh, these are operated by agencies outside of the uh, uh, MET services. And so again, the UN is a very powerful organization reaching you know, many, many countries. Uh, but again, uh, the World Meteorological Organization, much of the meteorological activity is happening you know, within the MET services within those countries. Uh, but in our case, the, the atmospheric composition goes well beyond uh, those uh, organizations. And so one of the challenges for us as to how can we continue to articulate the needs uh, broadly and have that translated to the nation and for the nations to, to support the research in infrastructure needed. And more and more, we're collaborating within the regional networks and networks operated by national regulations and conventions. Uh, and so this is a ever uh, a growing challenge. And, and the challenge to the community that we'll discuss, I'm sure, in this session, the next presentation by Marco will talk about this. We'll have a meeting uh, f uh, Wednesday night to talk about this is, uh, you know, how can we continue to evolve the observational uh, infrastructure needed to support atmospheric composition research and the services that society demands? So that's uh, uh, a challenge to all of us. So. We mentioned uh, quality uh, uh, assurance, quality control. Uh, we have a, a very important infrastructure to assure the quality of uh, our observations. Again, from this notion, that we need to be able to put observations together to provide maximum information, be it trends or, or whatever, but we need to be able to, to put the measurements on the same scale and to make them comparable if we're going to do our, our job as uh, uh, that's uh, required by society. So. And this observational uh, landscape is changing tremendously. Uh, you know, you know, one, one uh, great force now is this uh, low-cost sensors. Uh, they're very, very important. They're going to play a larger role in the future. You know, they're proliferating, pro proliferating in many ways. Uh, and certainly uh, our community, uh, the, the member states in the broader scientific community uh, need to provide information about uh, what is their fit for purpose, how can we continue to make use of them, how can they continue to evolve to provide the sorts of information that we need, uh, again, matching this, uh, the need for higher resolution, more personal information about uh, atmospheric composition. So one of the things that the Global Atmospheric Watch program does is that we can mobilize the community and do studies like this uh, uh, to do a, a very, I think, a, a very high quality assessment of the state of low-cost sensors as they existed in uh, 2017, um, and then 
look at those in great detail, provide some guidance to the broad community, to the vendors, uh, uh, to the agencies, uh, talking about uh, the strengths and weaknesses and the sorts of applications that are they're fit for purpose today. This is a, a great example of what the Global Atmospheric Watch community uh, can do. Uh, more and more as we think about the application space uh, is uh, we need the data, but we need the data to address certain problems. And, and more and more, as I mentioned, the data is coming from a variety of sources. We need to be able to discover atmospheric composition data regardless of where it's being generated. So more and more we're aligning uh, with existing networks, uh, federating the data. And so a big part of our plans and ongoing efforts are to provide this portal for management and discovery of atmospheric composition data. Uh, you can see many of the contributing uh, uh, networks that are participating here. But this is a, a major challenge for the community, but it's an important service to the community. And so this science for services journey, again, uh, uh, from the atmospheric chemistry perspective, I, I view the Global Atmospheric Watch program as one that's at the core of this translation. Uh, because where we sit, because of uh, the analogies that uh, translation of weather to services, the weather, the translation of climate science to services, and the translation of atmospheric composition uh, and environmental data to service. So WMO is undergoing this uh, high order uh, discussion, strategic discussion of uh, science for services. And so this is the overarching diagram that you see here, which is linking observations, uh, the importance of observations, to a whole bunch of uh, uh, services and end users of uh, different uh, abilities and, and some uh, end users being very, very specific uh, components. But as we look at this connection between observations and services, we have this whole area of data processing and modeling and the big data science that we hear more and more about even at this, uh, at this meeting. We see new and new applications of, of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, et cetera, being applied to these large problems. And research is underlying this whole operation. Um, and so this is a very, very important uh, diagram within the WMO of, uh, world in translating this into how we uh, organize our, our structures uh, to provide this uh, this prediction of science to services. Uh, and again, it's becoming uh, linking not just weather, not just uh, climate, but composition. And I'll come back to this in a couple slides, this notion of this seamless uh, trying to bring all these pieces together. Examples of applications and services development within the Global Atmospheric Watch. Uh, we do a lot of support of international uh, environmental conventions, mentioned since 1970s. Services for ecosystems, support for health services, support for transport security, volcanic ash, for example, food security, uh, atmospheric composition, agriculture. We'll hear a talk later uh, in today's session about that. Um, just some of the highlights that are cross-cutting activities that uh, cut across the Global Atmospheric Watch activity. Uh, one uh, important is this integrated global greenhouse gas information system. And we'll hear more about that in a, a talk, uh, two talks from now. Measurement model fusion, which is bringing together uh, optimal distributions of total deposition so that we can support a variety of science studies, including ecosystem service uh, and food security. And this notion of MAP-AQ, a partnership between IGAC and uh, WMO, where uh, uh, extending uh, forecast capabilities to regions uh, uh, and accelerating those activities in regions that are uh, underserved by those capacities. This is just one slide in the Integrated Global Greenhouse Gas Information System. In the interest of time, uh, I just point out that we're going to hear from this uh, in two talks from now. Uh, but this is a very, very important uh, program for not only the Global Atmospheric Watch, but for WMO and the UN system, um, and for nations moving forward in how to deal with uh, and manage the greenhouse gas-related information. I mentioned the model uh, measurement fusion for total atmospheric deposition. Another cross-cutting, and what I mean by cross-cutting is that combining across a variety of parameter space, uh, bringing together modeling activities with the parameters to develop, in this particular case, optimal uh, analysis of maps of total deposition that can inform, and how that deposition changes with time, that can inform 
for example, policies related to emissions reductions, can provide uh, e ecosystem service information for a variety of applications. Another important component is uh, the health. Certainly health is very important. Many of you uh, may be aware of this important summit that took place back in October of last year. It was a UN partnership to look at a global conference on air pollution and health. Uh, a lot of publicity, kind of this awakening awareness that uh, air pollution is the new tobacco uh, in terms of its uh, health impact uh, to society. Um, and uh, this was a very important meeting because it brought together a lot of people in awareness building, but also was focused on taking action um, and this kind of uh, aspirational uh, theme that emerged out of that was reduce the number of deaths due to air pollution by two thirds by 2030. You know, why not? Uh, uh, we know what the problem is. We know what the solution space is. Let's attack this problem with the same sort of uh, uh, enthusiasm and, and urgency that uh, we did tobacco. Um, and so coming out of that, uh, WMO had commitments for uh, out of this in terms of uh, there's a plan uh, and a new partnership, formal partnership with WHO and UNE uh, related to uh, taking on uh, health in this uh, concerted effort across the, uh, the agencies to, to really address this very, very important problem. And it includes observation, it includes increased modeling capacity at a variety of different scales. Um, and one important realization of uh, outcome of this is this uh, new integrated uh, air quality forecasting system, this MAP-AQ, it's a partnership with IGAC uh, and uh, Global Atmospheric Watch Program, and it's to, to really bring this focused integrated forecasting service applied to uh, health as its primary activity, but with many uh, additional benefits, uh, and this will be uh, a pilot project uh, for future global data processing and forecasting system, this GDPFS, which is an acronym that um, you can never remember, but it is a very important uh, uh, program that's driving how uh, uh, prediction, uh, the centers are doing uh, predictions of uh, climate, uh, weather, and air quality. And this is the overarching component of this, this uh, integrated observing system. I don't want to point out here, but it's linking the, uh, from the UN perspective and WMO, it's uh, the highest level organization strategy right now. Uh, it's linking the, the uh, sustainable development goals to society benefits and this notion of we need to be providing seamless predictions across time and spatial scales, across weather and climate and, air and atmospheric composition. And so this is uh, really feeding, uh, I think, everybody in the room that's with a major numerical weather prediction center or a major environmental center like NCAR and others are really upping their game in terms of uh, accelerating the development of Earth system models uh, uh, in this framework. And so this is a very exciting time for model development uh, and this notion of bringing these scales together in ways that we've talked about but uh, happening in accelerated fact. Certainly WMO plays in, in the Global Atmospheric Watch plays an important role in outreach and we do that through a variety of bulletins, assessments, and thematic reports. Capacity I mentioned earlier is a, is a very, very important component. Uh, again, the, the, the next generation requires, uh, uh, we need the next generation and, and uh, we just can't take that for granted. And so there's a variety of activities that are focused on capacity building, which we're doing on our own, but in partnership with many other organizations, which uh, all share the same vision and understanding of the importance of this. So, so to, to wrap up, we can just take a look what's next uh, for the Global Atmospheric Watch Program. Um, we continue our path, uh, again, uh, atmospheric composition matters. We want to advance observations and analysis of chemical constituents. Uh, and UV radiation to help reduce environmental risk to society from high impact weather and air pollution and to mitigate the impacts of and adapt to changing climate. So again, it's this continuing advancement of our observations and the modeling capacity to do that. Just to point out, I talked about the low cost sensors, but I think at the other end, uh, just these observing systems that we know that's coming online in the next few years are going to be a, an unprecedented capacity atmospheric composition from geostationary satellites. Uh, those are going to be a big game changer. Um, uh, those are very important. There's just one study that I want to put a plug in. Uh, 
NASA's doing a study right now from the Decadal Service. I'm uh, co-chairing a scientific uh, uh, steering committee. Uh, it's a joint aerosol clouds convection and precipitation study, really focused on uh, bringing together the aerosol and the precipitation cloud uh, interactions, which are uh, very, very important, from, from, be it from weather prediction to climate. Um, so that gives you a, a kind of a, a small uh, a kind of history and a update and a brief uh, peek into the future if, of the Global Atmospheric Watch program. And clearly, it, it takes a village uh, to move this forward. It's a tremendous amount of work done by a, a whole, you know, hundreds of uh, uh, people that contribute to the Global Atmospheric Watch program. And I just want to take uh, uh, just briefly, I'm going to uh, put this slide up, which is the uh, uh, Scientific Steering Committee. Um, and I would ask, uh, I know there's a few of you in the audience, please stand up. Uh, if you're on the steering committee, don't be shy. Yeah. Give you a hand. Yeah. And a whole number of uh, leaders of our scientific advisory groups and expert in science teams. And, and also, if you are in the room, also please stand up. So. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Uh, do you have some questions to Greg? Please come to the microphone. And so that you are not confused on the background, there are, there are the pictures which were sent for the celebration by the operators of the GO stations. Please go to the microphone. Um, thank you, Greg, for the very impressive overview of the GAL program. So, um, my sense is that the chemical compositions of PM matter more than the mass concentration, and I'm excited to see that uh, GAL do have plans for the chemical composition measurements. So my question is that um, uh, are heavy metals going to be involved for the uh, near future plan of GAL? Yeah, I would uh, defer that to the, uh, we, you know, we have a scientific advisory group for aerosols, uh, the aerosol SAG, um, and they continue to think about what their priorities are. And I know uh, metals are important. Mm -hmm. I don't know, right now I don't think they're the highest priority in terms of, uh, of, of the aerosol uh, SAG, but uh, we can talk about that offline. Uh, yeah, but in terms of the health sector, I think the heavy matters and organics matter more than other compositions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. your point's well taken, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I think the other, while you're up there, I think the other challenge in the, atm in the atmospheric composition, <coughs> aerosol composition component, speciation component is, there's a lot of data out there, uh, and much of that doesn't exist in the weather services, and so how can we uh, collect that data and bring it forward to the scientific community, so, yeah. Okay, our, with that, our, let's thank Greg once again. And thank you for your leadership, inspiration, and in moving us forward. So I would like to invite our next speaker, who is our also supporting GO program as a member of our scientific steering committee. Professor Marco Kulmula is academician and academy professor of Academy of Finland. He is a director of atmospheric science division in the University of Helsinki. Professor Kulmala published over 1,000 papers, 17 in Nature, 16 in our Science. He has over 45,000 citations and age index of 106. And since our 2011, he is the most cited, cited scientist in geosciences. Our, he's a winner of more than 10 international awards, including William Berkner's Award of the Atmospheric Sciences Division of EGU. He is a member of seven academies and has nine honored doctoral degrees and professorships. He is currently coordinating the development of global smear research infrastructure. He supervises 17 professors and 70 doctors. And we are really honored to have Marco helping us in running Goal program as one of the members of Scientific Steering Committee. Thank, Thank you. you, Oksana, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's actually very good to continue after the first talk since uh, 
let's think that my main aim is that after 10 years, we have this kind of hierarchy of stations where we have this very comprehensive stations, what I will now explain, the benefits of these, something like 1,000 in the world, and we get some 5 billion euros to establish those. We need one station every 500 to 1 million square kilometers. And then we need to have hierarchy of stations to use all of, all of uh, these. And now today I'm going to tell you a couple of examples why we need this kind of thing. And it's certainly related to global atmospheric quartz activation. Uh, as everybody knows, we do not have planet B. Our population is increasing, at least population is moving. We have urbanization, we have bigger and bigger cities. And uh, what does we need as a human being? We need good food, fresh water, fresh air, uh, energy, and of course, nice social life. But what do we get? Climate is changing, there is problems in air quality, there are epidemic disease, health problems, there are shortage in fresh uh, water and food supply, problems in energy production, biodiversity losses, chemicalization, deforestation, acidification, etc., etc. And all of them are interlinked. And if we really want to solve these things, we need to have enough data. We need, really need to have big data, both in observational point of view and modeling point of view. We need to work together with different disciplines. We need to work with science diplomacy. WMO and uh, this Global Atmospheric Watch, what we are celebrating today, they are key actors, or we are the key actors. Global smear is one idea which hopefully will be under WMO within this 10 years or so. And from ideas to implementation. It's easy to have ideas, it's easy to make good research questions, but it's much harder to implement them. And that's why we need certainly some work. And uh, if you think about global challenge, population, how much it increasing? Of course, there's estimations until 2035. What is the global gross domestic production? How much it is increasing? And then how we are producing our energy? And uh, this actually gives us the question, what happens to the emissions in the future, CO2 emissions? This black curve is the emissions, gigaton, uh, CO2 per year, and as uh, everybody knows, this 1990 is famous Kyoto year, and in practice we should be much below that in global emissions, if we look the agreements what our politicians or have done. And then if we look this uh, red curve, which goes down, it's uh, emission CO2 per US dollar. And if it would be in, in uh, generally speaking, uh, continuing this line, this slope, we would now be around 150 dollars, uh, 150 uh, uh, grams of CO2 per dollar, and now we are around 300. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if we would use this kind, not 1% technology, but 10% technology globally, the emissions will be 50% from the emissions today. And this is already one possibility which should be, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it is possible. Okay, and uh, what, is, what is coming is that uh, CO2 concentration is increasing all the time. And by the way, if you need to explain to some stakeholder, this is a make uh, private company people, you can always show this Mauna Loa CO2 time series from this 60 years to show that why continuous observations are crucial. Without that, we really simply even don't know how much CO2 we have. Okay, if you think about uh, this multidimensional, multidisciplinary, multiscale approach to answer grand challenges, uh, 
we need ground-based data, like global atmospheric watch data. We need satellite remote sensing. We need multiscale models and new theories. Also, we need very clear and ambitious vision from deep understanding to practical solution, empirical measurements, observations, modelings, and from research to innovations to also contribute to economic growth and human well-being. And as the integrated approach, looking this radiative forcing picture in IPCC, why we need integrated approach is that Unfortunately, still today, current observations are too fragmented. Global atmospheric watch are doing nice steps towards integration, and we need even more integration. There are different communities working in greenhouse gases, in aerosols, in air quality, climate, ecosystems, etc., etc. And although we have big meetings like this European Geophysical Union meeting, this community is very rare to speak to each other. And that's why we need integration. We need integration to understand feedbacks, to reduce, reduce uncertainties, to mitigate and adapt effectively. And very simple, observe, analyze, decide. That we already can go to the decision makers when we have enough data, the enough analysis. And now data, once again, ground-based satellite model. All these are needed. And uh, one, a couple of examples how we can do the integration. This is our Hyytiäläs Mare Station in Porel Forest. We have this uh, 126 meter high uh, mast there, and then we have a couple of small towers around, and uh, cabins, etc., full of instruments. And right now we are measuring more than 1,200 different variables. From atmospheric chemistry, from, from hydrology, greenhouse gases, forest ecology, soil dynamics, soil chemistry, atmosphere, trees, uh, soil. But the surface can be lakes, it can be forest, peatlands, or urban, or in cryosphere. This is site war, Icos Actris, Anae, Alter, etc., being part of different European. European uh, large projects. And one example of what we are able to do when we have this kind of comprehensive observations. And uh, I would like to say that without comprehensive observations, we cannot do this. If we measure only greenhouse gases or only aerosols, we are not able to get this kind of feedback loops. And in feedback loop point of view, for example, what happens when we increase CO2, we uh, increase also cross primary production and temperature. We increase in both ways emissions of biogenic, biogenic volatile organic compounds, and then we make uh, new secondary organic aerosols which affect on uh, cloud condensation nuclei, cloud droplets, clouds, etc., and uh, then precipitation. And then also we affect on the diffuse radiation, and global radiation, which feeds back to this cross-primary production. And yes, for example, we can measure very exactly in this kind of observations, for example, CO2 sink. And to observe CO2 sink is very, very important to verify a so-called compensation. In very many countries, people are speaking about to compensate their emissions. And, but how to compensate? If we do not measure them, we are not really able to verify them, what we are compensating. And soil is pretty important in CO2 point of view. Not only what is about the soil. That's why we need also to measure soil. Okay, but actually this kind of ecosystem is much more like forest. It's carbon sink, sometimes source. And we already know that it's a lot of discussion about decreasing the albedo. But actually, it's much more. It's a source for volatile organic compounds, for aerosol particles after new particle formation, cloud condensation, nuclear and cloud droplets. And it makes its own clouds and precipitation if you have a forest which is big enough. 
and how big forest we are needed to make its own clouds and precipitation. And uh, if we make this so-called time over land analysis, we are able to see that at least in boreal forest area, one million square kilometer is enough. Could be much, could be only half million square kilometers to make its own, uh, own uh, clouds and own precipitation to feedback it. But do we have this much free land? We need to take into account biodiversity. We need to take into account uh, food supply, agriculture, which means that in principle uh, to uh, take all emissions, all CO2 emissions back, we would need something like 50 million square uh, kilometers of uh, this kind of good forest to be a carbon sink. And if we take into account this feedback loop, carbon sink plus, uh, the climate effect could be 80 percent more. And uh, this has been now verified in, in our station in Hüthi, the Smer 2 station. Uh, when we increase CO2 10 ppm, which is about three, four years in practice, the photosynthesis or carbon sink has increased 8 percent, emissions or concentrations of volatile organic compounds 6 percent, aerosol effects 6 percent, and the diffuse radiation, uh, the ratio between diffuse radiation to global radiation 1.5 percent, and then it goes back to carbon sink and photosynthesis. And this kind of feedback loop would be good actually to measure a couple of other important areas. Like peaks area, what is this one year as an experiment area, practice Arctic and Boreal, China, and other East Asia, then Sahara and East Mediterranean Middle East area, which is pretty or very dry nowadays, then Amazonas, Africa, etc., and other areas also. And the metropolitan areas, which are, which are marked in this black dots. And this, this is uh, for the starting. And uh, that's why I have published this idea that built the Global Earth Observatory. And as said, we need the hierarchy of observatories. People have asked me that why I want to have thousands of them. But it's simply if we count them, uh, having every thousand kilometer one, it's about that size. And of course, it will not come uh, pretty soon. But what are the good for that? Researchers will certainly find new mechanisms and feedback loops. Policy makers could test policies and their impacts. Companies could develop environmental services further. And we need global organizations like WMO, Global Atmospheric Watch, to be heavily involved in these kind of things. Okay, then next question. Why I personally have been uh, during the last decade to be very interested what happens in China and Asia. If you take this circle, there are more people living inside this circle than outside of it. Very simple. And then about air pollution. Uh, already now in this red area, there lives about 10 percent of global population. 600, 700 million people. After five to ten years, there will be one billion people living there and it will be one city. And then urban pollution is not anymore local, it's regional. And my question already right now is that how many areas in the world do we already have where air pollution is regional in the scale of 1,000 kilometers, like that? This is more or less one million square kilometer, this red area. Okay. Some words about why something very small matters, like around one, two, three nanometer small atmospheric clusters and particles. Why I think that we need these 1,200 different variables to measure, not every site, not every environment, but most of them, 
Uh, for that reason that we are finding a lot of new mechanisms and feedbacks which will really help understanding and mitigating and adopting uh, our, our environmental senses. Okay, in physics point of view is mesoscopic physics, which is certainly one of the hardest areas in the physics. And uh, physics and chemistry and biology and meteorology are heavily interlinked in this size range. There is, for example, this new particle formation, nano size gas to particle conversion. It's related to climate sense and air quality from clusters to CC and or haze particles seems to be crucial, and from CC and the cloud droplets to clouds and precipitations, but also nanomaterials and pharmacy are related to that. And actually, this is related to not only climate change and air quality, but biogeochemical cycles and, and uh, ecosystem processes. Water cycle, sulfur cycles, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, etc. And uh, that's why the understanding all of these are important. And that's why if we think that the ozone is important, yes it is. Uh, VOCs are important, yes they are also related to ozone. Arsols are important, ozone and VOCs are related to arsol, mass and number, and size and composition. Yes, all of them are important. That's why to get as long-term data as possible with different variables is, is very crucial. One example on this uh, sub-3 nanometer is, is that uh, here we have all the time atmospheric clusters around 1-2 nanometer. They are include things like uh, sulfuric acid, dimethylamine, ammonia, different VOCs, and they have different oxidants like OA, Greek intermediate, ozone, and other NO3 minus and other oxidants. And we actually need to measure them. And for example, mass spectrometers, different atmospheric pressure interface mass spectrometers with chemical ionization methods, particle size magnifiers, and neutral best cluster and n ion spectrometers to really understand the dynamics, the physics, and chemistry of those as well as possible. Okay, then a couple of examples of the uh, basing smoke uh, about a little bit more than a year ago. We see here around nanometer size the lot of uh, new particle formed clusters. They are growing, growing, and when they grow around 100 nanometer, also the haze start to form and it's a visibility. And we have actually uh, at least indirect explanations how new particle formation will contribute to haze formation. And uh, I can even say that it's almost causal. And we are also able to observe the atom uh, composition of those atmospheric clusters. Here is the size of the cluster. Here is, for example, one sulfuric acid, two sulfuric acid, three sulfuric acid, two sulfuric acid, and one dimethylamine, three sulfuric acid, and uh, three amines, etc. Uh, oh, sorry, two amines which means that we are able to see even in polluted conditions from molecule to molecule, how the molecules are contributing to formation of new aerosol particles and afterwards formation of, of smoke and haze. And generally speaking, uh, starting is sulfuric acid and dimethylamine, then some VOCs will contribute to the growth. And we can see that when we, when we go here, more than 80% of the mass is airborne, and more than 60% of the number is airborne. And it's also related to this kind of heat island effect. Heat island uh, include, including uh, this boundary layer, uh, reduction of boundary layer due to the haze and also the heat island things. And if we have one million square kilometers, the heat island is pretty big. And it's not anymore island, it's some kind of uh, urban heat and pollution continent. If we have one million square kilometers. Of course, 
I do not have data from one million square kilometers, but I hope to have that data from one million square kilometers. And, and that's what as I understand together with uh, our Chinese collaborators like, like uh, Nansing University and Tsinghua University, etc., we are really developing this kind of approach. Okay, then what does this mean? If you now compare, okay, I take now only 30 years and I should actually take 89 and 19 to have a global atmospheric watch years, but this is now by end of last year. Uh, 30 years ago we think that uh, the effect of this smallest new particle formation has negligible effect on aerosol number load. Right now we know that it's 75 to 90 percent. The CCN load also, it's about uh, our understanding with think that it's a negligible effect. Right now, I can say this 50 to 65 percent. Haze particle concentration tables in Mega City is zero in 30 years ago now, very important contribution. And even effect on carbon sink, this uh, enhanced carbon sink, this aerosol effect. To 10 to 60, a moderate, I could say that actually almost 80 percent. And if we now think from clustering to global climate and air quality, I already mentioned this, that how it affects on the CC and and haze, but also via these feedback loops. And this is, as a summary, is pretty clear that this effect is much higher than we have thought even a couple of years ago. And if we think about some remarks, Comprehensive long-term continuous measurements are needed to solve the air quality problems and understand climate feedbacks and interactions. And NPF contributes to pollution. And the smallest particles matter. And I have already said several years ago that climate change, water and food security, urban air pollution, they are all uh, interacting with each other, and we cannot study them separately in practice. And even to say more, these grand challenges, they are impossible to address without multidisciplinary research infrastructure concept. And uh, what I have aimed to have 10 billion euros investments, we need also to educate 5,000 technicians and 5,000 scientists to operate there. This is certainly integrated concept with IGOS, ACTRIS, ANA, ALTER, WMO, CAO and GEO in collaboration or even leading that in future. There is contributions already from US and several other countries and number of stations hopefully are increasing to us 100 within the next 5 to 10 years. And, uh, and if we think about the global impact of this integrated synthesis, uh, we, ne we need this global Earth Observatory with high quality open data that we can really use our best uh, artificial intelligence methods, for example. That. Uh, it needs to contribute to inno innovations and gro economic growth to scenarios for mitigation, adaptation, environment and health. In regional and sectoral impact both, we need this knowledge transfer, we need the next generation of scientists in a very multidisciplinary way. And but we also need to work as a science diplomacy. Since as a scientist we are able to make diplomacy in the way that normal diplomatic or political level when they cannot. And uh, have also this policy, policy impact. Any questions? Thank you, Marco. Are there questions in the audience? You frightened everyone with your last slide. <laughs> <laughs> they are afraid to ask you questions. Okay. So can you can you just summarize in in, in one word? Uh, one word. Okay, in, maybe not in one word, but maybe in a couple of words. How, how do you see the, the, the role of GORE in, in happening 
are of this integrated concept, our way in how we can work together to our build up those our observatories which are required. Hmm. Let, let, let's, let's say that uh, how I see it is that already uh, these uh, existing and new visions and uh, implement implementation plans, what I have seen and heard, goes in the same direction. The only point is that we need to find out uh, much bigger funding resources. And uh, this is what uh, I'm not the only one who is uh, working for uh, towards that goal. But then when we are getting those, there need to be some global organization who are then being the leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do not see any reason to make a new organization. That's why I think that in the uh, longer run, but it's not ne this year, but after five, ten years or within five, ten years, uh, WMO and uh, in the present organization, especially Global Atmospheric Watch, need to be the organization. Okay, thank you, Marco. Our, if there are no questions, we will continue with the next speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah Mikalov Fletcher is a carbon cycle expert at the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. And thank you, Sarah, for traveling and helping us with the symposium. Your work focuses on inferring greenhouse gas emissions and uptake and the impact of ocean carbon uptake on marine ecosystems through ocean acidification. To address this question, she brings together atmospheric and ocean measurements, high resolution mod modeling and statistical techniques. Sarah also leads the Carbon Watch New Zealand research program and NIVAS CO2 and related gases measurements and modeling effort. She also serves as an editor for the journal Global Biogeochemical, Biogeochemical Cycle. Sarah, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a modeler myself, but I have built almost my entire career on working with the atmospheric data from GAS, so it's a really great honor to me to be invited to speak and celebrate the 30th anniversary of this measurements program. So there was a really beautiful introduction to IGES from the first speaker of the day, Gregory. Um, IGES is the Integrated uh, Global Greenhouse Gas Information System, which is a GA initiative to help facilitate work that brings together what's happening in the atmosphere and with independent bottom-up bottom type estimates of greenhouse gas emissions and uptake with uh, supporting emissions reductions um, and policy from the business level right on up to the global scale. And I'm running a pro project that's considered a nationally funded program, so we've got our own funding, but that supports that, I guess, agenda. So I'm gonna be talking about New Zealand's greenhouse gas program and our work there and how we're working to um, address the needs of different groups of people across New Zealand who are really engaged with climate mitigation. <clears throat> in support of the IGES mission. mission. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about, in more detail about the path from the atmospheric observations, the atmospheric observations to action, and how this fits with the bigger picture. Uh, New Zealand has a really unusual greenhouse gas pro profile, um, <clears throat> shown here in this infographic. Uh, unlike most countries, CO2 emissions account for less than half of our gross emissions. That's partly because we're such a strong agricultural population with a popu with, uh, country with a population of around four and a half million uh, that feeds around, estimated to be around 40 million people around the world. <clears throat> so CH4 and N2O comprise quite a lot of our budget, but in addition, our um, electricity generation sector is 80% renewable, which also reduces the CO2 component. <clears throat> When I first arrived in New Zealand and started thinking about using the atmospheric data to infer emissions and uptakes, I anticipated methane might be considered the most important greenhouse gas to get right, but people were really excited to understand the CO2 part of the budget. And the reason is that 80% um, of our methane emissions are from agriculture, and that's considered to be one of the better known um, emissions in the, um, in the spectrum, or best quantified emission sources. 
but uh, the forest carbon is considered to be, carbon uptake is considered to be quite uncertain. And New Zealand has essentially met all its past climate treaty commitments almost entirely with forest carbon uptake. And in addition, the new government has pledged to make New Zealand carbon neutral by 2050. And a big part of that program is to plant a billion trees over the next 10 years. So it's probably never been a more interesting and exciting time to understand exactly what those trees are doing with greenhouse gases. So how do people normally estimate forest carbon uptake? Um, <clears throat> from the perspective of reporting to international treaties, the National Inventory Report, um, the currently accepted methodology is to develop a network of sites all around the country and go around to those sites on a regular basis and measure the circumference of every tree in those forest plots and gather some data about uh, the height of the forest canopy and then use allometric equations and land cover data to scale that up to get an estimate of the national forest carbon uptake. And these methods, they're endorsed by the previous IPCC um, guidelines for how nations should report these things under the climate treaties, which was issued in 2006. Um, but there, no one really thinks that these are a com comprehensive picture of how much carbon the forest is absorbing. There's lots of things happening in the soil, in runoff, in the canopy that are not going to be captured by these types of techniques. And that's where atmospheric data can add quite a lot of value. So I really loved the title of the session. Um, moving from uh, pure research to uh, integrated services. And this figure really uh, exemplifies our transition as a New Zealand atmospheric research community from uh, you know, a, a research focused, a, a pure research focused site to providing services for greenhouse gas emissions mitigation. So this is Bearing Head, it's our longest running site, it's outside of Wellington. And um, in fact, it's been, around, it's been around as a CO2 observing site for longer than I've been around as a human being on this earth, started in, in 1970. And um, this is the atmospheric CO2 observed at Bering Head from when the wind comes right off the ocean. And a combination of CO2 characteristics and meteorological data tell us that that air has not traveled over land for a very, very long time before arriving at our station. So this is the clean ocean background signal. And for a very long time, this was considered the primary research output from our Bering Head atmospheric observing site. It's probably this, what's called the steady interval data has probably been used in hundreds of papers looking at either global processes or southern ocean processes because it's a really good site for observing the southern ocean. But here, oops, wrong way. Here, what we're interested in is this data. So this gray data is not just the data that's selected from when the air comes off the ocean. It's, the, it's, it's all of the data that's collected at Bering Head over that time period. And this data set, and especially the difference between these data from when the wind is blowing over land, the difference between the data measurements when the wind is blowing over land and when the winds come off the ocean, contain a wealth of information about the carbon sources and sinks in New Zealand. Um, this, is my, this, uh, this is another New Zealand observing site. It has a really special place in my heart because it, um, <clears throat> It's the first site that we got to place, especially to, un to look at New Zealand's terrestrial sources and sinks. It's Manga Kakaramia in the central North Island. And the, um, the instrument is inside this little Department of Conservation hut. And then there's um, inlets up on this tower. And so now we're moving from trying to observe CO2 in forests from going around and measuring individual trees. And instead, we're looking at um, measuring CO2 that's been exchanged with the underlying biospheres that's traveled all along this landscape. So the strength of this approach is also its weakness. The strength is that you really see the whole story, but the weakness from the perspective of supporting, um, supporting uh, treaty reporting is that you observe everything. So it's never really going to replace those bottom-up estimates where you go around and look at forest sites because we won't be able to separate between different types of land management very easily. But by working together alongside that bottom-up community, we can both improve our methodologies and estimates. Another really important place where this can, oops, again, the wrong way. I must have more jet lag than I thought. Another really exciting part of this, uh, uh, 
a place where the atmospheric observations can add value here is in the time domain. So this is the first five years of data from that Manga Kakara Mia site, and the red values represent the real data. The blue values are fill data based from where we have observation gaps. And then the black line shows a uh, lowest line fit to it. And you can see that generally you have, as you expect, um, low CO2 in the summertime when photosynthesis is stronger and high CO2 in the wintertime when it's weaker. But during this period, in, start in the summer of 2018, you have almost no CO2 uptake. You have a little bit of CO2 photosynthesis signal in the spring, and then it really flattens right off. And that also corresponds with the biggest drought and the biggest heat wave in that region in New Zealand's history. So you're seeing almost in real time the response of that forest to CO2. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, um, Benedict Spahn has a poster on it on Friday. In order to translate what we're seeing at the atmospheric CO2 data into fluxes at the surface, you need a really good atmospheric modeling. So these simulations show the atmospheric model that we're using. Um, it's underpinned by NIWA's weather forecast model, which is run operationally at one and a half kilometers all across New Zealand. To the best of my knowledge, no other country is doing that nationally all the time. So we use the winds from that, and then we run uh, a, a Lagrangian particle particle dispersion model on top of that. So we release, um, at every point where we are analyzing the data, we release a group of particles, of CO2 molecules essentially, and let them run, skip backwards along those winds in time and disperse. And this basically shows you an influence function of what parts for one particular point in time for a single hour of a single day, um, what parts of the world influence that measurement of atmospheric CO2. But the beauty of using atmospheric data is that the atmosphere really integrates the information for you because the winds are always changing. So if you run one of those simulations every day for two years and you add them all up, you get um, what's called a footprint map that looks like this. So this is all the places that you can see in New Zealand from just that one observing site at Bering Head where the purple and red values show places that you see quite often and the yellow values show places that have a weaker influence on the atmospheric observations at Bering Head. And then these blue lines are the main pathways that the air flows along. And then this um, shaded region shows that souther southerly selected um, study interval data, the data that we use as our background picture from when the air is coming off the ocean. Um, can you cue up the video? So this is approach of using atmospheric uh, models and data together to estimate CO2. It's been used internationally quite, quite often to look at global to continental scale effects, but what's really the frontier work right now is being able to use it at that national scale and the subnational scale, which is what you need to be able to inform policy. And we have a bit of an unfair advantage in doing this, and that if you're looking at a regional picture, you really need to be able to understand what's going on in the air outside of your domain, and that can be quite a hard problem. But for us, we have this advantage that we're an island surrounded by oceans. So when the air arrives at our Bering Head station coming from the south, it's been a very long time since it's seen contact with the land, and we have a really clean baseline against which we can compare our observations from our other sites, Lauder in the central South Island, and Manga Kakaramia, which I showed you earlier, in order to estimate how much carbon is being absorbed by New Zealand. Can I go back to the main presentation now? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the first results of a pilot study showed some really intriguing results. Um, the, when we first started this, um, this work in New Zealand, we sat down with the, our opposite numbers in the carbon inventory community and government to talk about where we could really add value. And what they were really excited about was the opportunity to have independent estimates that could tell them, you know, they're estimating this forest carbon sink that's about 30% of our emissions. And it happens to just almost perfectly match how much we've gone over our emissions targets in the Kyoto period. And they're keen to see something really independent and if it could also match essentially the sign of what they're seeing and confirm that New Zealand's forests are a significant carbon sink. And in fact, what we found is that um, 
if you, that they're probably, New Zealand's forests are probably 30 to 60 percent stronger of a carbon sink than the National Inventory Report suggests. So the, the error bars of the National Inventory Report and our, es our estimates overlap. I should mention also that it's a non-trivial task to compare what you see in the atmospheric inversion with what you get from these type of National Inventory Report studies because there are differences in the way that they count things for policy reasons and what we see in the atmosphere. But if you really sit down and go over it with your opposite numbers in, in, the, in those types of fields, you can get something that's pretty close to one another and we've estimated a 30 to 60% difference. Um, a lot of this additional CO2 uptake was occurring in a place that wasn't really expected in the southwest of the South Island, which is a region that's dominated by mature indigenous forests. So the traditional thinking is that when you disturb a forest, you get really quick carbon uptake as that forest regrows, but then that uptake levels off. And this suggests that for some region, the reason the indigenous forests in that area might be a bigger carbon sink than previously thought, which is important because the, the logging of forests of that type are not costed in the emissions trading sch scheme nationally. So that's very relevant to whether or not our emissions trading scheme is doing what it says on the box. Um, if you'd like to hear a little bit more about the work from this, I have a talk that goes into more detail on these results um, on Friday session, I guess session, that Phil DeCola and um, Tom Oda are organizing. Um, so I just wanted to mention briefly that um, in order to really, this is an exciting result, but in order to really be able to use it, you need to show more clearly exactly where that sink is going. So based on this preliminary result, we're putting up a small mini network of sites in that region that appears to be um, the big carbon sink, uh, which is known as Fjordland where we'll observe air coming into that region and then in the interior and measure not just CO2, but a cocktail of different trace gases and isotopes that'll help us to, just to really identify what's causing that sink. <clears throat> um, in addition, we've launched this new program. We got quite a lot of funding to do it called Carbon Watch New Zealand. And um, that consists of three big areas where we're doing regional studies to help answer questions that are important to stakeholders in those regions. But then in addition, all, all of those individual studies, in addition to having value in their own right to some group of people who are engaged with climate mitigation, they'll all feed into our national scale atmospheric inverse modeling effort and the national inventory report. Um, and I'm just, I, I don't, don't really have time to go into depth about of what all is in the box in this program, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how these measurements are benefiting different groups of people under this program in New Zealand. So one really exciting area is we're going to do an urban scale inverse modeling effort for the city of Auckland. About a third of New Zealand's total population lives in Auckland, and the Auckland Council is really engaged with reducing climate, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions at that city scale. Um, <clears throat> they're involved with the C40 Cities Initiative, and a big part of their portfolio of, um, a big part of their strategy are programs like the Carbon Neutral Parks Program and other programs that look at urban greening within Auckland City and in the forests around it. So when we first started talking with the uh, Auckland Council about doing this type of work, we, our, our first guess really was that we were gonna see, they were gonna ask us a lot about looking at fossil fuel emissions reductions and being able to track those with these atmospheric observations. But what they were most excited about was really having a good handle on how large the urban biosphere sink was and how the urban biosphere was influencing that because they really didn't have um, very much data on that. They were essentially using some data based on how trees grow in forests, which you would expect to be quite different from how trees might grow in a city where they're watered, fertilized, and have lots of access to light. So we're set establishing now um, an uh, urban scale inversion where we're gonna measure both CO2, Auckland's kind of a skinny little city in between two bits of ocean. So we'll be able to measure CO2 and then other tracers that'll help us distinguish between the fossil fuel component and the terrestrial biosphere component. Um, another, well, there's quite a lot of forest work going on under this program, but another group of people that I was really keen to talk about is the Lake Rotorua and Lake Rotoaria Forest Trusts. 
So they manage forests on um, behalf of 17,000 individual Maori for forest owners. So the Maori are the um, indigenous people of New Zealand, if you're not aware of that. And <clears throat> right now, the majority of that land is planted with exotic trees. So it's Pinus radiata, which, much like myself, is an import to New Zealand from the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And the traditional thinking is that Pinus radiata is a very strong carbon sink because it grows quite quickly. But their question is really about what's the total carbon footprint of our for forest? Um, what, how much carbon is the, are the trees absorbing? And how is that offset also by logging activities and the traffic of trees, of vehicles coming into the domain and informing um, longer term um, decisions about how to manage that land. One thing that's been a real treat about working with them is that the way that they think about managing that forest is really long term and much more aligned with how those of us in the atmospheric measurements community and the atmospheric modeling community might think about things. And then we have quite a lot of work in the grasslands area. And um, so that New Zealand does have a really big agricultural sink, so part uh, agricultural component. So um, there'll be a lot of um, work looking at uh, how much carbon the grasslands are exchanging. So at the moment, it's not even clear if our grasslands are a CO2 sink or a CO2 source. And there's quite a lot of conflicting scale data at the paddock scale from eddy covariant studies. So the um, inventory community would really like to just know a clean answer from a region of large contiguous agricultural use, you know, what, what's our, what, what are our pasture lands doing with CO2? But now that they've seen all these interesting results with CO2, they're also uh, really interested in getting, in seeing us do methane as well. So I mentioned earlier that at first it didn't really seem like the most exciting target because the emissions were thought to be quite well known of methane, and that's still true. But there's been a lot of investment on the part of the government in trying to develop techniques to mitigate methane emissions. And they'd like to be well placed that if one of those techniques bears fruit, they're able to see whether or not it's working out in the field. Um, and in particular, New Zealand, you know, you still pretty much have this picture of cows in the field. And that's um, much, it's much harder to know if the methane emissions reductions from, say, uh, feed additives or from, um, or from uh, other types of interventions are working than if you have cows in a barn environment when you can monitor them more closely. Um, <clears throat> And so then you might ask, well, this is lots of cool research, but how does this really go from being an exciting research topic to something that you're really able to implement and that feeds into supporting the Paris Agreement? So this is the pathway that takes, takes us from the atmospheric CO2 measurements to action. And this is, this is really an implementation pathway that um, I drafted alongside my op opposite number in the Ministry from the Environment. Um, <clears throat> So there are two different pathways. One is co-development of better reporting methodologies. So you know the reporting methodologies are, un are underpinned by the UNFCC and IPCC principles of transparent, accurate, consistent, comparable, and complete accounting. But within that, individual countries have quite a bit of flexibility to develop models that are informed by their own country-specific data data like the sorts of data that we as an atmospheric community can provide. So if we can identify that there's a larger or smaller carbon sink than what's inferred from the current system, then that, that becomes essentially a hook for them to be able to seek additional resources to improve their estimates and to work in tandem alongside improving those estimates. Now there's another pathway which is quite a lot more, more direct, which is if we are able to provide the first quality information uh, estimates in a, in a space where little or no information is available. So for example, um, carbon um, uptake emissions are not estimated in the NAIR for any non-forest forest land uses. They're all assumed to be essentially in steady state. So, um, so if we were able to get really good information about the CO2 exchange from pastures, 
then that could really be adopted directly into the inventory. If we got really inf good information about the terrestrial biosphere in the Auckland region, that could be adopted directly into the inventory report. And once those are validated, they can just kind of slot right in. Um, and then this, this is, I've talked a lot about New Zealand, which is a little country far away from everything, a small component, but um, this is really to be thought of as an example case. So, um, you know, the, the, the new IPCC guidelines, the 2019 ones that are about to be released, will recommend a much stronger role for atmospheric observations. And um, the Global Atmosphere Watch's IGIS program is seeking to f provide a bridge between science and policy for these emission sessions. And if you'd like to learn more about this, I really recommend you go to the IGIS session, which is this Friday, and see a whole host of people besides just me who are working on problems like this. And I wanted to end um, on something that's not at all my own research. It's a paper from Nisbet at all. But I think it's a really clear example of, of um, a case where we really have a responsibility as an atmospheric community to engage with the bottom-up community and with the policy community to inform, um, to inform action under the Paris Agreement, and it's atmospheric methane. So um, over the period of the 1990s and 2000s, atmospheric methane uh, was in a relative plateau. And then in around 2007, the atmospheric methane um, started to take off. And then here in 2014, um, it really started to take off at a much steeper rate um, <clears throat> following that stable pe period. Now, so that's what we know as an atmospheric measurement community. Um, the IPCC AR5 simulation, AR5 report, um, uses representative concentration pathways to force models to look at um, how different types of emission scenarios are going to affect climate in the future. And um, these are, this is the methane emissions for three of these scenarios. So this is uh, 8.5 is considered to be the business as usual scenario. This is the middle of the road, scenario 4.5. And this one, RCP 2.6, this is the only one that satisfies the um, stated goal of the Paris Agreement to stay below 2 degrees C. So this leads to warming of 1 to 2 degrees C. And you can see that this pathway assumes that we start reducing methane emissions very, very steeply starting in around 2010. And this is the atmospheric measurements that have actually happened since then. And you can see that we're well above the 4.5 and 2.6 already. And the reason that, we're, that the methane emissions have grown so strongly in the last decade or so is still really unknown. There's been a lot of work suggesting that it could be a tropical wetland effect, which then you know, is potentially a climate carbon feedback. There's been work suggesting it's an atmospheric chemistry effect. And there's been work suggesting that it could be um, much more agriculture happening in the tropics and in Asia than previously thought, including a paper that I've been co-author on. And that makes a really big difference in, um, so we really had, this is really the most important time um, or a really critical time for integrating what we know as an atmospheric community with the bottom-up community so we can understand what's causing these types of things and feeding that back quickly to the policy community so we can get real numbers about the emission cuts that are needed if we want to stay below warming thresholds. Um, you know, in the end, the treaties are based on emissions, but what matters for the climate is what's going on in the atmosphere. And that's what we as a GOG community have to add. So that's, that's my talk, a quick summary. Um, but I'm happy to just go for questions because I see my time is at its end. Thank you, Sarah. And while you're asking uh, one short question, I would, I would invite the community not to leave, please, because we wanted to have a little bit of interaction with the audience. So while you're formulating question to Sarah, I would like the rest of the community to take your mobile phones, please. Connect to internet.
technical glitches. Okay, so if you, if you can go on the website www.menti.com, please take your phones, please. And are type in the code 89-28-89. And are, I would like you to reflect on the questions which we address in this Mentimeter. You can see the results directly on the screen. Okay, we have six people who have voted. People from Go are also allowed to vote. Phil, Marco, you can also vote. Okay, so we have about 30% of the audience who never heard about Go before coming to this symposium, and about 30% who are associated with Go. So I would strongly encourage those who have never heard about Go, talk to people who are involved in Go. So we go to the next slide. Uh, this slide asks you about in which areas do you think Go can play the important role? And it seems that majority of the community thinks that Go role is to coordinate the global observations. The second place, yeah, is the fostering atmospheric composition research. Greg, it's a good uh, thing for thought that we are still observational, <laughs> not research. <laughs> okay, so the next one is under which UN agency Go operates, and it seems that everybody get it that we are under WMO. <laughs> still, some people think that we are under UN Environment or the World Health Organization. And even three people are thinking that Go has nothing to do with the UN system. <laughs> okay. Okay, super. So that is our, the, the word sketch. What do you uh, value the most personally about Go program? And you can see that in the core there is a coordination, measurements, outreach, global, and precision, which is our very good reflection of what we do. Okay, I'll still wait. On the previous there were 70 people voting.
Okay, the questions which are addressed to the, wow, Jesus Christ. Greg, you have no lunch. <laughs> so I think that our Greg and our Kobos and our Marco and Marcos will address your question and we'll get back to you and the, uh, after the next blog. I, I think this is it. <laughs> Okay, so there were 19 votes here. Is it uh, time to break for lunch? <laughs> so while you're so hungry, any questions to Sarah? There are some people who can still work in other 10 minutes. Are there questions to Sarah? If, if no, no questions, Sarah will be here in the second block as well. So you can always come to her and ask the questions. And because you are so hungry, we break here and we will continue after lunch. Thank you so much. Okay, dear colleagues, welcome back after the lunch break. And I would like to kindly ask you to take a seat and we now start with the second half of our Union Symposium for the 30th anniversary of the Global Atmosphere Watch program. I'm very happy you, are, you came back. And now we have some outstanding presentations that will also um, highlight the value of science for society. So our first speaker after the lunch break is Xin Wang. She joined the School of Atmospheric Sciences of the Nanjing University in 2014 after she got her PhD degree at Peking University, and she was then appointed associate professor in 2017. Her research focuses on high-resolution emission inventory development, air quality modeling, and aerosol climate interaction. She has published about 50 papers in international journals, which have been cited more than 1,500 times. Her research was reported by Science News, Nature, China, and many other news media. Okay, and now I'm excited to hear the presentation of Qin Wang, which is about aerosol planetary boundary layer interaction, an important process for haze pollution mitigation in both megacity and regional scales. Thanks for the introduction. It is such a pleasure to present my work here. And today my talk is about uh, aerosol boundary layer interaction, an important process for haze pollution mitigation in both mega city and regional scale, uh, mostly in China. It's well acknowledged that uh, China is one of the most polluted regions across the world. This is the uh, satellite retrieved surface PM 2.5 concentration distributions in China, from which we can see that it's China was, uh, is suffering from the high uh, concentration of aerosol, in addition to the well-known adverse impact to human health. Such a high level of aerosol concentration can lead to rapid uh, visibility deterioration. In addition, it's worth noting that atmospheric aerosol is also an important force for climate change. Um, compared to well mixed uh, greenhouses uh, gases, aerosol's uh, radiative forcing has huge uncertainties. Since aerosol um, has different chemical components and its uh, different chemical uh, components can exert totally different radiative impact on uh, climate systems. For example, uh, the scattering aerosol like sulfate and nitrate may lead to a cooling effect of the Earth system, but on the other hand, the light absorbing aerosols like black carbon may uh, pose a positive radiative forcing at the top of the atmosphere. Yeah, th this makes the aerosol's radiative uh, in fact is m much more complicated than greenhouse gases. In addition, we all know that uh, the aerosol pollution features also uh, uh, obvious special heterogeneous. That means uh, such a high level of aerosol concentration in East China may have a substantial impact on regional climate. Another, uh, we also know that the boundary layer development is driven by the incident solar radiation. And aerosol's radiative impact is expected to influence the boundary layer evolution. 
but uh, currently, how does aerosol, uh, how do aerosol um, collusion, its radiative impact and boundary layer meteorology impact with each other? It's not, uh, ha haven't been fully understand, uh, understood. And that's why my recent uh, work is all about the boundary layer interactions. Before we dig into the aerosol boundary uh, layer interaction, here list some questions that are to be addressed. First, uh, how does aerosol radiative in fact impact boundary layer evolution? Uh, what is the detailed pro uh, physical and chemical mechanism doing uh, in this kind of interaction? Second, can the aerosol boundary layer interaction be observed by us? And what is the key uh, factors influencing this kind of intera interactions? Also, as mentioned above, the uh, uh, aerosol is a mixture of different chemical compositions, uh, including the scattering aerosols and the light absorbing aerosols, and which uh, chemical components dominate this kind of aerosol boundary layer interactions. Let's start from the case studies of aerosol boundary layer interactions uh, for uh, different, uh, typic, uh, different type of air pollution from megacity to regional scale. First, uh, First, we'll talk about uh, urban pollution. Actually, it is a sea case in December 2013 that inspired us to study aerosol boundary layer interactions. Here shows the satellite image and ground-based observations of PM 2.5 concentrations across China in that month. From which uh, it's clear that the, the whole East China is covered by the sea haze and the PM2.5 concentration in many megacities like Shanghai, Nanjing, and Beijing existed 100 microgram per cubic meters. And according to the uh, field measurement conducted in Nanjing, we found that uh, uh, associated with growing PM2.5 concentrations, the boundary layer height was rapidly declining. To further explore the aerosol role in boundary layer uh, evolution, we applied the WolfCam model, which has three-dimensionally chemical and meteorology online coupled model. Here we designed uh, three parallel numerical experiments, one with aerosols radiative, uh, in fact, and one without, to further explore the respect uh, contributions from different aerosol components, include, uh, like a scattering aerosol or light absorbing aerosol. We also conducted another one with only scattering aerosols, in fact. We connect all the, uh, all the me uh, measurement data to validate the model, including the PM concentration, the uh, incident radiation flux, and the surface heat flux. Surprisingly, we found that only in the simulation with um, aerosol's radiative feedback can we reproduce the, the PM uh, pollution levels and also the incident, incident radiation flux. On the other hand, uh, the numerical simulation without aerosols in fact or with only uh, scattering aerosols can, cannot will reproduce the, the pollution level which underestimates the PM um, 2.5 concentrations by um, almost 100 uh, microgram per cubic meters. And by comparing these different uh, parallel numerical experiments, we demonstrate the detailed pro processes of aerosol boundary layer interaction in megacity. First, aerosol have a bulk effect to block solar radiation reaching the ground surface, resulting in an overall dimming effect and uh, suppressed boundary layer development uh, by uh, weakened the surface heat flux. Another, light absorbing aerosols like black carbon could heat the atmosphere by trapping the, uh, the solar energy and resulting in a strong heating in the upper boundary layer, which changes the temperature stratification and further suppress the boundary layer development. For the typical extreme haze days in Zhengzhou city, we found that only considering the uh, aerosol's radiative feed, um, feedback can we reproduce its kind of temperature stratification. And to further explore the respect uh, contribution, contribution from different uh, aerosol component, components like black carbon, scattering aerosol, and the overall impact from aerosol, we conducted a one-dimensional sensitivity uh, simulation. And it confirms that the black carbon, especially those in the upper air, plays a dominant role. Even though with the burden ratio lower than 13% of the total column, the, the upper level black carbon could cause a drop of the daytime boundary layer height comparable to that of the whole, of the, uh, the whole total column black carbon. 
And given the important role of black carbon in this kind of uh, uh, ring interaction, we also named it as aerosol boundary layer interactions, the zooming effect of black carbon. That is the heating in the upper boundary layer and the decreased surface, decreased the surface heat flux substantially depress the development of boundary layer and consequently enhance the occurrence of the extremely extreme haze pollutions. In addition to, uh, to the single megacities, it also increased the PM 2.5 concentrations on a large scale on the regional scale. It, from this uh, figure, we can see that the East China, <coughs> the PM 2.5 in whole East China was increased by almost 80 uh, microgram per cubic meters uh, for the daily mean. And uh, the cross section from so Beijing to Nanjing gives us a more clear picture. From this picture, we can see that uh, the locally emitted aerosol and other air pollutants, which are uh, supposed to be diffused vertically or dilute, diluted vertically, are confined, were confined in a more shallow uh, boundary layer and re uh, led to the accumulation of near surface pollution, which is more related to the human health. And the positive uh, feed gap, feedback between aerosol pollution and the boundary layer evolution may lead to the, uh, uh, the increase, uh, increasing occurrence of extreme heat pollution. And that is uh, highly possible uh, related to uh, the frequent haze pollution in China, even though the emission control is very st uh, strict nowadays. In addition to the urban fossil fuel combustions, uh, East China also features intensive biomass burning emissions. Uh, the most uh, typical one is the agricultural fire of the wheat straw in the early summer. During the harvest seasons, the black carbon emissions from the agricultural fire is much more intensive than the anthropogenic activities. The most intensive angry fire em emissions give rise to the uh, days long haze pollution uh, in East China, and uh, including Nan uh, Nanjing. Here gives uh, a picture showing the dim uh, yellow sky in Nanjing that day. During these hazy days, uh, the weather forecast system seems uh, totally wrong. And first, the predictor forecast air temperature is almost 10 degrees centigrade lower than the observations. Second, uh, the forecast convective rainfall has never happened as predicted. To explore uh, the aerosol's role in this weather anomaly, we used the self-development uh, uh, daily daily emission inventory and webcam simulation to uh, demonstrate the detailed mechanisms. So here shows the numerical simulation, uh, PM 2.5 mass loading and the sat satellite retrieved uh, aerosol optical depths. Both the simulation and the sat satellite image uh, is indicative of a sick bed of aerosols in, the, in East China. Such a high level of uh, aerosol loading caused substantial perturbations in radiation balance. When validating the, when validating the model, we found that uh, the high concentration of aerosol substantially decreased the downwelling uh, shortwave radiation and also the surface uh, sensible and the latent heat fluxes. The weakened uh, surface heat flux, uh, heat, uh, heat flux gave rise to the near surface dimming, uh, dimming cooling tendency near the surface. And uh, the biomass burning plume containing planting of black carbon, which, was, uh, which is a light absorbing aerosol component led to uh, substantial atmospheric heating around the two kilometer altitude. And such uh, opposite uh, temperature response near surface and uh, in the uh, upper boundary layer led to uh, substantial change modifications in temperature stratification. Such, uh, such changes in temperature stratification uh, substantially weakened the convective motion or turbulent, turbulent mo mo motions in during that day. And uh, the uh, smaller uh, vertical velocity uh, associated with the weakened uh, turbulence motions it's not favorable for the updraft of the water vapor tra transport. And in addition, the atmospheric heating 
did lower the relative humility. Both of them contributed to the dissipation of the convective ring, uh, dissipation of the convective rainfall. From this case, we can uh, conclude that aerosol boundary layer interaction can not only influence the near surface pollution, but also can somehow modify the uh, regional weather condition, including the precipitation. In addition to uh, black carbon, we all know that uh, dust aerosol is another light absorbing aerosol component in the atmosphere, as the main contributor to the uh, um, aerosol mass loading. Uh, dust aerosol exerts more complicated uh, in, uh, in fact on radiation transfer since that it can not only absorb the solar radiation but also interact with the long wave, uh, long wave radiation. We also uh, conduct a similar, uh, similar simulation for one typical dust storm event. We found that during daytime, the aerosol boundary layer interaction due to dust storm is similar with that of black carbon. That is, uh, the caused opposite temperature response near surface and, uh, 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 and that, that is the near surface steaming and uh, atmospheric heating, in fact, uh, during daytime. daytime. Things that the dust emission is very sensitive to the meteorology field, like wind speed and uh, turbulence, mo turbulent motion. The daytime dust emission can be substantially weakened by this kind of re reaction. But during nighttime, it posts a uh, totally opposite effect. Enhanced nighttime convection can promote the long range transport of dust aerosol. And as discussed above, uh, East China is factors of multiple emission source sources. The aerosol. Uh, the aerosol can be from uh, the dust storm and by mass burning emission and also fossil fuel combustions. Under uh, specific weather conditions like cold fronts, um, such a complex uh, emission, source, uh, emission source can, can undergo long range transport and mix uh, with each other and forming the multiple uh, pollution structure with a uh, high level of light absorbing aerosols, which may exert possible significant impact on middle or uh, lower uh, tropospheric meteorology. And uh, here we provide some uh, case study of aerosol boundary layer interaction from megacity to regional scale, including the uh, urban pollution, biomass burning plume, and dust event. However, most of this study are based on numerical simulations. Um, we couldn't help wonder if we can find some long-term and direct observational evidence on aerosol boundary layer interactions. Thus, we connect all the data for the winter of 2016, including the PM concentrations, radio sound observations, and reanalysis data. Here, we also introduce the OMR temperature difference, which means the observed temper uh, tem temperature minus the, the corresponding values in reanalysis data. Here we adopt the ER interim uh, reanalysis data. It's, it's produced by the ECMW uh, F, uh, forecast system, which haven't not explicitly considered aerosols impact on meteorology yet. So we think, uh, we think that uh, this difference can somehow reflect the impact of aerosol. Here shows the uh, time series of the PM concentrations and the difference between radio sound observations and reanalysis data. We found that the, as the pollution got deteriorated, the difference and, and the gaps between the radio sound observations and the uh, UI reanalysis data uh, differs. Uh, di uh, is, uh, the, the gaps between these two data is in increasingly sub substantial. And after the air was get uh, cleaner, and these two data agree well with each other. To for, uh, further uh, analyze the, the observational evidence, we select the typical uh, week-long uh, haze event during, in the middle of December of 2016. Here shows uh, the satellite image and ground-based observation of this haze pollution during this, peer, uh, during this time period. We found that the lost China plane, including, including Beijing, uh, was suffering from a high level of aerosol concentrations. And here shows the time series of, uh, at, of a PM 2.5 concentration at Beijing. We found that at the beginning, the PM 2.5 concentration gradually growing, and uh, uh, on the last two days, it keeps at a very high level. 
And uh, during its haze pro uh, pollution events, uh, when we see the radio sound uh, observation, we found that the temperature inversion is getting, uh, was getting more substantial as the pollution deteriorates. And the gaps between the radio sound observation and reanalysis data is more substantial when the PM2.5 concentration is higher. And its, uh, it's difference also holds true uh, in spatial distributions. Here gives uh, the uh, comparison of the uh, spatial pattern of pollution and the temperature bias uh, during uh, clean days and hazy days. We found that it's kind of uh, Near surface cooling and uh, upper level heating is more substantial when the PM2.5 concentration was higher. And we also want that if we can got, uh, get some uh, statistical and long term observational evidence of the aerosol boundary layer interaction. So we connected seven years of the PM concentration. Uh, and the radio sound observation and also the reanalysis data to compare the overall difference um, between reanalysis data and, observa and observations during clean days and polluted days. The comparison clearly showed that the aerosol do uh, modify the temperature stratification, which factors the upper level heating and near surface dimming. After realizing that the uh, most essential feature of the aerosol boundary layer interaction is the at, uh, atmospheric heating and the near surface uh, dimming, we proposed an index to represent its, the aerosol boundary layer interaction in density uh, by summing up its two terms. And we found that this index can uh, uh, correlate well with the PM2.5 concentration as well as the next day pollution deterioration. We also combined the sound, sounding observations, aerosol, aerosol observation, and one-dimensional online coupled wolfcam model to study the key factors influencing aerosol boundary layer interactions. Based on our previous work, we found that the important role of aerosol vertical distribution uh, in this kind of aerosol boundary layer interactions. So we carried out hundreds of uh, simulations with different uh, aerosol concentration and uh, altitude. And we found that aerosol boundary layer is extremely sensitive to the aerosol vertical profile, especially those near the boundary, uh, boundary layer top. Also, we found that the dome effect of black carbon can be significantly intensified when, BC, when black carbon gets internally with uh, scattering aerosol. And uh, the boundary layer top decrease in rural area area could be greater than that uh, in the urban area. After get uh, some basic and general information of the aerosol boundary layer interaction, we tried to get some technical and poli uh, po uh, policy implications from this aspect. From this figure, we can see that the uh, aerosol boundary layer interaction is very sensitive to the vertical distribution of aerosol, and it's very sensitive to the aerosol near the boundary layer top. But in current uh, chemical transport modeling, the vertical resolution is uh, relatively coarse, and it's, uh, the, the vertical grid, uh, grid setting is uh, decreased with altitude. But the fully densified vertical uh, grid setting is, uh, have uh, very expensive computational cost. So we, pro uh, we proposed the optimized vertical re resolution setting. By, densify, by densifying key levels, uh, for example, the near surface level and the boundary layer top. And we found uh, the improved model performance on temperature stratification, near surface air pollution, and also diurnal va variation of aerosol reproduction by uh, optimizing vertical uh, resolution settings. The detailed information also can be found uh, at this poster in this afternoon. <coughs> Here gives a clear picture on uh, aerosol boundary layer interaction and uh, highlights the BC, uh, black carbon's role in this kind of in interactions. And we conclude that the dome effect of black carbon uh, can enhance the haze pollution in China by stabilize, stabilizing the boundary layer, boundary layer development. However, when we see the global black carbon emissions, we found that East China is still uh, hot spot of uh, uh, BC emission. 
And unfortunately, China's PC emission uh, is still growing in recent years. And we propose that the black carbon reduction can be served as a more efficient uh, way to uh, mitigate haze pollution. And it also co-benefits the climate change. Given the vital role of the high level, uh, the upper, upper air aerosol layers, we also think that uh, the emission control of elevated point sources could be uh, a cost effective way to reduce the regional air pollution. And here comes uh, to this, uh, the summary of this, uh, my work. First, we found that the light absorbing aerosols like black carbon and uh, mineral dust play a very important role in aerosol boundary layer interactions through their radiative impact. Such kind of impact could also influence the uh, regional weather and the rainfall patterns and the intensity. Second, the dome effect of black carbon could substantially enhance the, the near surface haze pollution. And third, we propose reducing the emission of light, light absorbing aerosols served as an efficient way to mitigate the haze pollution and co-benefits the climate change. And also we have a general picture of the aerosol boundary layer interaction. There are still a lot of issues to be addressed in the future. As shown here, the aerosol in the atmosphere can influence uh, many meteorological fields like radiation, temperature, relative humidity, boundary layer, turbulent, turbulent motions. It further uh, posts perturbations on photochemistry, aqueous phase chemistry, heterogeneous chemistry, and a diffusion, and even dry deposition of aerosol, and whereby uh, influencing the formation and accumulation of aerosols. So it's still very challenging to quantify the respective contribution from different uh, pathways of aerosol boundary layer interactions, and also <coughs> improve the numerical descriptions on key factors like aerosol mixing state, and including the uh, light absorption of uh, organic carbon. Also, it's, it's, very, it's a challenge to understand the role of boundary layer interaction in regional transport of air, air pollution. And here shows some ongoing work uh, that has been done by our, uh, my, uh, our research group in terms of the aerosol boundary layer interactions. First, we tried to uh, conduct a direct vertical measurement on radiative active aerosols and uh, secondary components using the airship platform. And also, we want to develop an uh, observational-based ba one-dimensional model or large AD model to, better, uh, to get a better and quantitative understanding on the detailed physical and chemical processes in aerosol boundary layer interactions. And also, we try to improve the parameterization and conduct a multiple-scale meteorology and chemical coupled simulation to better understand aerosol's impact on regional and even global climate. And uh, that's a brief introduction of uh, uh, my, work op my work on aerosol boundary layer interactions, and thanks you for your attention. Thank you very much for this overview of your work. Is there a quick question for Shin? Thank you, that's really very interesting work. Um, as you know, Mesoscale models have a hard enough time already trying to simulate the boundary layer dynamics uh, even without these very interesting aerosol interactions. And you talked in your last slide there about the coupling between the composition and the, and the simulations impro improving those parameterizations. I'm wondering if you've seen any evidence of improvements in mesoscale models' ability to, to simulate boundary layer uh, processes by adding in uh, these processes of uh, the f direct effect of the aerosols. You mean the improvement of, uh, of the regional model to better pre uh, represent the aerosol boundary layer interaction? Just, I mean, in recognition of the fact that independent of any aerosol interaction, the models already have a hard time getting the boundary layer right. Have you seen any evidence so far that you can improve their ability to represent the boundary layer by adding these interactions? I think uh, first we we need to uh, improve the uh, the calculation of the the uh, optical property of the aerosols, and we also need to uh, set um, 
refined the vertical res resolution of the regional model to better represent this kind of interactions. And uh, as we all know that there is a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, a lot of aerosol components that is also light absorbing like uh, organic carbon, but it haven't uh, included that in, in the current model, which led to be improved in uh, the fu future work. Okay, thank you very much. And we will now move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Vinayak Sinha. He's an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali. Uh, he has set up a new state-of-the-art atmospheric chemistry, chemistry research facility in northwestern India, in which houses India's first proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer and a self-developed OH reactivity instrument. In 2016, he has received the Nazi Scopus Young Scientist Award by Elsevier in collaboration with the National Academy, Academy of Sciences India, recognizing his work in academic research. He is a co-chair of ILEAPS, a scientific steering committee, and of a working group of the atmospheric composition in the Asian monsoon, an emergent spark IGAC activity. His current research is focused on fundamental radical and ozone photochemistry with the objective of improving the current understanding of emissions and air quality over the Indian region. And his presentation will be the nexus between agricultural management practices, biomass burning, air quality, and ozone-induced crop yield, crop yield losses. Vinayak, the yes. floor is yours. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the kind introduction. And a very good afternoon to all of you. So today I'd like to share a few findings on the nexus between agricultural management practices, biomass burning, air quality, and crop yield losses. And I think I couldn't think of a better way to start the talk than by showing you a picture of the lush green paddy fields from an agricultural field very close to where I live in the northwest Indo-Gangetic Plain. Right, so today's talk has been structured in three parts. In the first part, I shall focus mainly on the agricultural management practice that deals with the handling of a large amount of crop residue that is generated from this activity. And the second part of the talk will focus on the impacts of the burning of this crop residue, which occurs on a very large scale, on very short time periods, um, on the regional air quality and atmospheric chemistry. And finally, in the third part of the talk, I shall discuss how the associated ozone pollution, which is in fact ramped up by this agricultural burning emission, in turn affects the crop yields. And hopefully I shall be able to end with one or two solutions on how to in, uh, ensure more sustainable interactions. So this is the wrong direction, yes. So let's start with a picture of the global distribution of agricultural land holdings. And what you see in this picture is that in contrast to most of North America and Europe, large parts of the world, in particular South Asia, many parts of Africa, many parts of East Asia, are actually dominated by small agricultural land holdings. And this has important implications for the type of agricultural practices that people in these regions adopt. And collectively, it is quite remarkable to see that this accounts to, uh, comes to about 40% of all the area that is uh, used for agricultural purposes. So if you zoom in on South Asia, for example, even the European Space Agency map can show you that 80% of the land use actually consists of irrigated croplands. And the main cropping system in this region, in the Northwest IGP, is wheat and rice, with some potato for early uh, paddy varieties also grown in between. And um, most of the results that I'll be showing you today are actually uh, have been acquired by a facility that I set up in 2011. And you see that in this map here, in Aysar Mohali, which is a very representative suburban site. And if you look at um, the land, uh, the surface wind flow, 
This is very strategic because most of the year, the wind flow is from the northwest, which is the agricultural land use area, whereas only in the monsoon season, it veers to come from the southeast direction. Right, so what is really remarkable is that in the last five decades, starting from 1965 to about 2015, this area has really been transformed on a very massive scale. So in the top panel, you can see that the area just under paddy and wheat cultivation increased by more than three times in this 50-year period. In the bottom panel, you see how the production has been ramped up by a factor of 10, more than 10. And while this has been great news for the food security of a nation like India, and indeed for millions across the world, this has come, no doubt, with collateral environmental costs. And um, just to tell you how this was accomplished, in the 1960s, that was when the first introduction of mechanized harvesting practices was introduced in this region. And in the 70s, the Green Revolution made possible by high-yielding seed varieties and extensive use of fertilizers further augmented the production. So associated with this production is also a large amount of crop residue. And if you now look at the ways in which this is handled in this region, then the top uh, four boxes sh show you the major uh, technologies that are currently extant. And what is remarkable is that there's one common machine that is uh, used in all four of them, which is this combined harvester uh, machine. So this combined harvester is very, very effective in actually um, removing the grains from the crops, but leaves a large amount of the crop residue in the field. And um, a large number of farmers burn much of this crop residue. But recently, there's been another innovation in the form of a happy seeder, which is able to sow the wheat through the paddy straw in the field. And uh, the paddy burning is really the major issue in terms of air quality, because this happens at a time of the year when accumulation of pollutants is very favorable closer to the surface. Right, so this cesspool of emissions um, with consists of primary organic aerosol, primary inorganic aerosol, and what have you, finally can undergo oxidation in the atmospheric environment and again form a large number of secondary pollutants. And of course, this air pollution then has effects on the crop yield. And here you see an illustrative picture of wheat grown in Punjab, which is really stunted when it is grown under polluted conditions. So I addressed uh, this emission activity by uh, this facility that was set up and um, as you can see, this is a fairly comprehensive suite of gas phase measurements. This is just for you uh, to see a few pictures from the actual field. So if you weren't sitting in the room right now, but were in the northwest Indo-Gangetic Plain, you would see a very golden landscape, beautiful golden landscape of standing wheat crops, which turns black in a few weeks. And similarly, in October, the lush green fields of paddy, they turn black, most of the area. So uh, this is something you can detect even qualitatively with satellite. And uh, in the post-monsoon season, that's when the paddy straw is burnt. And in the summer time, it's the wheat straw that is burnt. This is to give you an idea of the spatial extent of these fires, which is pretty remarkable. And now if you look at the chemical data on the top panel in the left corner, you see a C2-nitrile, which is a chemical marker for biomass burning. And the red Data always corresponds to the periods affected by the crop residue fires, in this case, the paddy residue burning activity, and the blue to the pre-harvest when the fire uh, activity from crop residue burning is absent. And what you can immediately appreciate is that no matter what hour of the day we talk about, the enhancements in a large number of, first of all, the chemical marker for biomass burning emissions, as well as a large number of health-relevant molecules, such as benzene, which is a human carcinogen, are significantly enhanced. And what I found really nice in terms of observations here is that the enhancements are more pronounced and occur at a time when the farmers actually set fire to their fields. 
And this happens primarily in the late evening hours when law enforcement is at its weakest. And um, I guess many of these emissions would be expected because it is known that biomass burning can emit the suite of compounds. But what we found to be a very remarkable discovery in terms of the air quality impact was the uh, discovery of photochemical formation of a molecule called isocyanic acid. And isocyanic acid concentrations, just hold on for this for a minute, is uh, frequently above 1 ppb. And you can also see that it has a strong photochemical source, just like ozone, but also a very remarkable secondary source that appears, uh, sorry, a primary emission source in the late evening hours that appears during the fire impacted periods. And um, this was something, this molecule was recently uh, reported from atmospheric environments by Jim Roberts' group in the US. And its toxicity really comes from the fact that um, at concentration exposures of more than one ppb, when inhaled, it can dissociate within the human blood um, at the pH that's about 7.4, and from NCO minus ion, which can then uh, denature various proteins involved in various human functionalities, such as vision and walking arthritis. And uh, it's a very close chemical relative of one of the gases that was released during one of the world's worst industrial disasters, namely the Bhopal gas tragedy, which is methyl isocyanate. So um, the photochemical formation pathway has been uh, really well established, and it's primarily OH oxidation. But the message here is that in order to form isocyanic acid, you need precursor molecules such as amides and alkylamines. And these alkylamine compounds have incredibly high OH reactivity. So um, some of the things that people sort of realize without knowing the causative agent now become more clarified with these measurements, which is that uh, there is obviously a very significant increase in eye-related complaints during the periods affected by the paddy harvest fires, paddy crop residue harvest, uh, post-harvest fires. Right, now that we've seen uh, a little bit of what happens due to the crop residue burning in the post-monsoon season, let's look at the summertime, because this is a very contrasting time of the year. It, conditions are really, really dry. Temperatures ramp up to 45 degrees Celsius. And uh, it's a very, very exciting time for an atmospheric chemist, because that's when you see a lot of photochemistry. So um, when you look at similar profiles of uh, the mixing ratios of different compounds versus hour of the day, um, by now you know the red corresponds to the crop fire inference period when the wheat straw is burnt and the black to the non-crop fire inference period. Um, you can again see that acetonitrile, the chemical marker for biomass burning, is significantly enhanced. But here you actually see a large number of photochemically formed compounds. And again, uh, some of these have been very rarely reported or measured in atmospheric environments like hydroxyacetone, butane, 2,3-dione. And isocyanic acid is even higher than the post-monsoon period measurements. So if uh, now one is interested in knowing what fraction of the reactive chemical composition is um, perhaps not measured by the suite of uh, compounds that are routinely monitored, then OH reactivity is an excellent parameter to employ, uh, to, to measure. And the way you do this is that the total OH reactivity is a proxy for the total reactive pollutant loading because most emissions molecules you see here react primarily with the OH radical. The total OH reactivity is defined as the product of the rate constant of a molecule with the OH radical multiplied by the measured concentration of that pollutant. And so now if you have a direct measurement of the total OH reactivity, which you can compare with the OH reactivity calculated due to the measured compounds, then any difference between the two enables you to tell how much of the reactive fraction of the chemical composition of air still remains unmeasured. And uh, this is a nice picture from a review article published in Atmospheric Environment which shows how this single parameter has been able to improve our understanding in different atmospheric environments. 
Of course, you see that considering the measurements that were available when this paper was published, there's still a big gap over India. So one of the first things we did was to try and address that. If you uh, look at, so I'm just cutting to the chase and showing you the final results of the OH reactivity measurements. In the Norton crop fire influence period in summer when wheat straw is burnt, the absolute OH reactivity is only 28 per second. And actually with the measured chemical composition of air as well as the modeled chemistry, we can almost fully account for the compounds that are present in the air. So we have a very good idea of the reactant mixture. On the other hand, if you look at the crop fire influence periods, the absolute number increases by more than a factor of two to 64 per second, and we can not account for about 40% of the reactant mixture that's out there. So this has large implications in terms of fundamental understanding, and of course we were keen to know what could be responsible for that. So for that, we undertook experiments in the field where we sampled the smoke right where the burning action occurs, we brought the smoke to our labs, and we were able to measure the emission factor, which is basically the gram of the compound emitted per kilogram of the biofuel burned. And the key point here really is that during different stages of the fire, you get very different amounts of emission. In fact, in the flaming stage of the fire, which is associated with a high modified combustion efficiency, there are many compounds that are negligible or hardly emitted. But the, uh, in the smoldering stage, which persists in the actual fields for hours together, uh, you actually see emission of amine compounds and amide compounds, which can actually help you close the OH reactivity. Now, uh, that was all about primary emissions, but what is the impact on ozone? So here you see a picture which shows you the 20 ppb enhancement in surface ozone. Of course, ozone is more tricky because it can be due a combination of all these three factors, so we checked out each of these in turn. Uh, when we looked at the solar radiation, we didn't find significant difference, so definitely it wasn't the radiation that was responsible for this enhancement. When we looked at uh, long-range transport, then we filtered the data for air masses that were uh, local, with, as in they had spent the last 72 hours only over the region, and actually in that case the enhancement even went up from 19 to 28 ppb, so that was not a driving factor. And finally, the, the emissions in terms uh, of the proxy for biomass burning emissions, acetonitrile really showed it's due to the emissions that were the driving factor. So this is just a picture to tell you that we don't just rely on one molecule, but actually with the suite of compounds that we measure at our site, we can distinguish between different forms of biomass burning and also fossil fuel burning. And this is a summary of uh, the second part of the talk, which was the effect of the emissions on air quality. And uh, the key point that has not been mentioned so far is just that if you want to be able to understand the impact of biomass burning emissions in an atmospheric environment, it's really very important to include the chemistry of these nitrogen-containing organics, which are, in most chemistry models, still very poorly represented or not present at all. Okay, so now to the third part of the talk. Here you see a picture where you see a field that has just been burned but next to it, there is a plot with standing crop and also a potato field and other fields and the different stages of cultivation. The point here being that this burning activity occurs in a staggered manner. So one man's emissions can affect the other man's crops. Um, and, and then it is very meaningful to actually look at the crop harvesting patterns. So for example, there are early rice varieties and there are late rice varieties. And uh, the early ones mature in 90 days the late ones in 165 days. And so you can have the case very frequently in October where when the early ones are harvested, then the crop residue burned from that, uh, it actually ramps up the ozone and it can affect the yields of the late harvesting, uh, late maturing rice varieties. So this is just a summary of which crops are very, very strongly affected by this burning. Now, knowing that the ozone can affect the crop yield so significantly, what exactly are the estimates in the literature concerning the same? So this is a table that lists most of the published work on this, and I could speak one full hour and more just on this table, but I shall not do that today. Um, I just want to highlight one major deficiency, or two rather, in these studies. The first is that all the studies in black, they actually use uniform 
crop cycles, growing season cycles. So for example, for wheat, they use December to February across different climatic zones in India, which makes no sense because in March, you still have the early sown wheat maturing and in the flowering stage when it is most sensitive to ozone and when ozone concentrations in the ambient air are quite high. Um, so that's one of the issues. And these estimates are all over the place, as you can see. The lowest putting the figure at about 1 billion US dollars, the highest at 6 billion US dollars. And uh, the study in red was actually performed by a group where we took into account the actual cultivation periods of the crops in two states of India. Now, um, one of the things that is uh, a limitation of all of these studies is the fact that they assume that ozone in the air actually means ozone inside the plant which of course we know is also not true because it depends on whether the stomata are open or closed. And in order to address that particular issue, we uh, used leaf porometer measurements on a commonly gold, uh, grown cultivar, PB, uh, PBW550. And what you see on the left-hand panel is basically the degree of the stomatal opening versus various environmental response functions for the water vapor uh, uh, deficit here simply means how, the dry, how dry the air is, the temperature, and the photosynthetic, act, uh, photosynthetic active radiation. And the purpose of these plots was to tune the parametrization in the DOSE model, which actually can uh, give us the flux of ozone going into the cultivars, um, and uh, to know when each of these environmental response functions becomes a limiting factor for the stomatal conductance. And you can see that after having uh, done the necessary parametrization, tuning in the model, uh, in this middle panel, we can actually reproduce the stomatal conductance in this cultivar fairly well. And here comes the bad news. The bad news is that just from this rice um, cultivation, over six growing seasons from 2012 to 2018, the uh, estimated losses are even higher than what has been published in the literature. And these numbers, I can assure you, have been checked and rechecked. And uh, the person who did this work, Dr. Babel Sinha, she couldn't be here today, but she is busy writing up these papers, and I hope soon you will see it in the peer-reviewed literature. Now, of course, one can appreciate that this is a matter of grave concern because it concerns the food security. And also keeping in mind that most of these developing regions of the world are expected to be the global hotspots for future surface ozone increases. In particular, the South um, Asian subcontinent. So we really need to be able to get to the bottom of this. Right. I am now ready to summarize some of the findings. So I hope in this talk today, I could uh, make you aware of certain the issues or certain issues. And one of the things, of course, is that there's really a very complex nexus that exists between agricultural practices, air quality, and crop yields. There are very significant differences in the way agriculture is carried out in developing countries and developed countries. Developed countries typically have monocultures. In developing countries, the same agricultural plot is actually used for a large number of other activities as well. And so this is important to keep in mind when we want to develop solutions that can be implemented in different regions of the world. Um, you could see that the atmospheric chemical composition has a direct bearing on the crop yield. And um, there are still lots of gaps in terms of our fundamental understanding. Two that stand out, again, from the point of view of developing countries is the simulation of ozone. You can find thousands of papers in the literature, which really raise my BP a little bit, because they simply take the measured ozone, tune their model, and reproduce the measured ozone. But it's absolutely not clear in many of these studies. I understand it's a starting point. It's a good starting point. Somebody has to do that work too. But one should not take, uh, take it that the science behind that has been fully uh, solved or is well understood. Because often in these same studies, they talk nothing about the validation of the emission inventories of the precursors of ozone in these regions. So they're pretty silent on that. And the other is, of course, how the ozone 
uh, how much of it actually, which is in the air, goes into the cultivars depends on the growing season period that is considered in these analysis and also in act being able to do actual measurements using a leaf porometer. So farmers are both actors and victims. And I have to say that it is they who bear the brunt of the health risks because they are closest to the place where all these emissions occur. Of course, it's, it, they are the ones who are the protagonists, but at the same time, one cannot ignore the fact that uh, we all consume the food, and they are the ones who have to take the biggest hit when it comes to health risks. Finally, I don't want to end this talk on a gloomy note. Not everything is gloomy here. The happy cedar machine that I showed you, which is capable of sowing the wheat seeds through the paddy straw, has actually started to make a very big difference in terms of the crop residue burning emissions released into the atmospheric environment. And the good thing about, is it, about it is that it's able to bring co-benefits also in terms of yields and retaining the nutrient availability in the soil. And this is just to tell you that in 2008, there were only about 300 of these. In 2018, there are about 7,000 of these that have been employed. And this year, I hear it will cross 10,000. So with that, I'd like to thank all the wonderful people and all the funding agencies that have made this kind of work possible. And I'd like to, uh, in particular, thank WMO GO program for the travel support. Otherwise, I was not planning on attending the EGU this year. Um, this is Dr. Babel Sinha. And there are a few students from the group also in the audience, I think. So these are the people, Gina, uh, Gina Mills, Felicity Hayes, and Alex Gunther Gren Wolf, who uh, were also very, very helpful for this work. With that, I am happy to take questions. This is from Punjab. I hope one day some of you may visit the place and I can treat you to the cultural extravaganza too. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vinayak, for sharing your insights to the impact of the atmosphere on crops. And now we have time for a short question for Vinayak. Since uh, you're working in a world where there's both rice and other cult cultivars that, you're, that are being grown, I didn't hear you mention something about the role that the methane from the rice is playing in this whole picture. Maybe you could say a word about that. Okay. So um, actually, uh, there is a program that looks at that. One of the intentions of um, setting up the facility that I did in India was to tackle problems that are not addressed by other research programs. So when it comes to methane emissions from uh, PADI, uh, there's a lot of work that's being done by the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi. And uh, we uh, also know of a new initiative, actually, which has been uh, instigated by the good offices of the WMO, uh, which will be carried out by the Ministry of Environment and Forests in India. So this, they, they will uh, do monitoring of uh, all the greenhouse gases during different growing seasons. So yes, my work doesn't cover that part. I am not looking at that. But this is something that will be tackled. But, but methane is playing a role, certainly, in the chemistry that you're focusing on. Um, so actually, this is, again, a perspective that comes from the, developing country, uh, the developed countries. Uh, if you look at the reactivity, and the contribution of individual compounds as precursors of ozone, then yes, during the crop fire influence periods, we do see enhancement in methane, but it's reactivity. So about 1,800 ppb of methane is only 0.3 per second. One ppb of isoprene from this pyrogenic source is about 2.7 per second. So uh, in terms of this, it's not that important. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. And we move on to the next presentation which will be given by Angela Benedetti. She's a senior scientist in the atmospheric composition team of the Earth System Predictability section. She joined the, Earth, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast in October 2002 as a research consultant in cloud radar data assimilation. She was the main architect of the aerosol analytics that is now operational at ECMWF as part of the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service. 
and she continues to pioneer the assimilation of new observations, such as satellite and ground-based LIDAR profiles of aerosol backscatter. Her most recent research focuses on the radiative impact of atmospheric aerosols on weather at the monthly and seasonal scales, and she's a member of the Global Atmosphere Watch scientific advisory groups on applications and on aerosols, and of the WMO Sand and Dust Storm Warning Advisory and Assessment. She's a member of the Steering Committee and a regional node of Northern Africa, Middle East, and Europe. Her presentation is about the close linkage of at atmospheric composition and weather prediction. The floor is yours, Angela. Many thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to be here. It's really my pleasure. I will be uh, talking to you this afternoon about the close linkage between atmospheric composition and weather prediction. This is an experience uh, from the ECMWF point of view, which is uh, uh, my institute. And uh, I have uh, several colleagues to thank for this uh, um, uh, presentation, and you will see their names um, in the course of the presentation. So um, we know that uh, numerical weather prediction uh, models are well suited for forecasting atmospheric composition because they provide a framework with realistic transport and the characterization of removal processes, for example, precipitation, which are very important for the air quality. But also, the atmospheric composition can affect the weather, and that's what we're going to explore in this presentation. And you can see that... This is a very complex system with a lot of different emission sources, uh, both uh, natural and anthropogenic. And then you have uh, uh, all the transport and removal processes that happen both in the trop uh, troposphere and in the stratosphere. So it is a very complex system. And um, the reason why uh, we need complex models is because the system is complex. So that's uh, uh, my message. Um, just looking at some constituents that affect uh, the weather, the aerosols are known for the impact. You have uh, natural emissions uh, from several sources, uh, the sea, sea salt, you have desert dust emissions from deserts, that you have uh, uh, biomass burning aerosols from smoke, and then volcanic uh, um, ashes uh, from uh, volcanic eruptions, and then you have anthropogenic emissions. And the, the aerosols interact with the radiation um, by reflecting the radiation, solar radiation back to space, also absorbing, depending on the type of aerosols. And also, they uh, interact with clouds and provide, for example, cloud condensation nuclei and modify the characteristics of clouds as far as interaction with the radiation. So they are very important players. Um, here's what I call an aerosol dilemma. So we know that the aerosol radiative impacts depend strongly on what type of aerosols are emitted. Uh, for example, if you focus on this uh, top panel, and it's a figure taken from uh, Sunset, Sunset and uh, co-authors from 2016. Uh, if you look at the column that says BC times 10, this is the impact that BC uh, multiplied by 10. It's, so it's a scenario of a black carbon increase. Um, the impact that it has on temperature change uh, top, the precipitation changes, and then what it's called the, um, the um, hydrological sensitivity, which is a total change in precipitation per degree of global warming. All the models here that are represented by the various bars uh, basically agree there is quite a bit of diversity between the models in the amount, but the response of black carbon is different from any other forcing. And in particular, as far as this uh, um, um, hydrological sensitivity, the response of the black carbon is negative. Um, so uh, what happens then, what you uh, operate in an air quality um, like a, a strong uh, reduction of uh, aerosols, for example, in an air quality policy scenario, you basically change the um, global warming. And it's interesting because uh, um, you, you think that uh, obviously cleaning the air is a good thing, which it, it is for the environment, but it can induce locally very big changes and actually enhance the global warming. So this is like some things that we need to uh, think about. Um, the other species that I'm going to look at is ozone, and ozone um, also is important for weather um, because uh, um, it's the main UV filter in the stratosphere, so life as we know it wouldn't exist without uh, um, the ozone. 
But um, in the troposphere, ozone is a pollutant, as we just uh, heard, and uh, um, it's also a greenhouse gas. So it's uh, important to see you know, what, um, what happens with ozone. So here's a table um, summarizing the potential that atmospheric composition has to impact the numerical weather prediction and via a different mechanism. So you have uh, the species on one column, and uh, for example, ozone, aerosols, and greenhouse gases impact directly uh, NWP through dynamics and thermodynamics because of the interaction with the radiation. The aerosols also interact with precipitation and clouds uh, via indirect effects. And then again, um, aerosol, uh, CO, and uh, ozone um, can actually have an impact in the analysis uh, through the tracer mechanism, so can be uh, somehow used to infer winds from the um, uh, for DVAR. And then you have uh, uh, the radiance assimilation in which atmospheric constituents are very important because they determine um, the radiative transfer uh, and the, the radiance at the top of the atmosphere. So if you want to uh, model radiances and extract, for example, temperature, water vapor information, it is very important to model correctly the atmospheric constituents. And then you have uh, methane, uh, which is a source of water vapor in the stratosphere by oxidation, and then CO2, which is very important for the surface heat fluxes. And actually, the, um, these constituents can affect uh, all different ranges of weather uh, prediction, from the analysis to the medium range, subseasonal range, and seasonal range. And I'll show you some examples of this. Um, well, um, it was recognized already in the early 90s um, that, uh, um, that it was very important to model these uh, processes. And uh, this was uh, um, a paper by Hollingsworth, uh, Tony Hollingsworth and co-author, in which he recognized that uh, many advancements had been uh, achieved uh, in weather, uh, numerical weather prediction, but at the time, the early 2000s, was a new era for uh, um, weather forecasting and for environmental monitoring. So it was like the next step. And this is in fact what ha has happened at ECMWF over the number of, uh, over the course of the years. Um, there's been a lot of progress and uh, um, with the implementation of uh, several uh, project, European projects. Yeah, we were here. And the, um, that you, you see listed there. So the integrated forecast system, which is the numerical weather prediction model um, developed at ECMWF, has been enriched with the several components. For example, coupled uh, chemistry, aerosol, greenhouse gases, and now integrated chemistry. And the stratospheric ozone was already there in the late 90s. And these um, components have been used to um, improve uh, current climatologies, and uh, also, at the moment, in the CAMS configuration, they are uh, uh, running interactively. Went too quickly. Yes, the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service um, has been uh, operational since uh, 2015, and uh, it provides uh, um, air quality forecasts up to day five, which are then downscaled for a European um, domain. And uh, it's basically uh, based on inputs, fire emissions, anthropogenic emissions, and uh, model-derived emissions for natural aerosols. And it uses a, a, a large number of satellite data to uh, produce uh, their, the models. And the um, ground-based observations are used for the verification of the model prediction. And this model is based on the ECMWF uh, meteorology and has integrated chemistry and aerosol representation. What's the quality of the atmospheric composition forecast? Well, these uh, um, are illustrations of the um, IPK uh, skill score for um, aerosol, and you see in black the uh, global trend, which is from 2012 uh, to 2016 going up, so increasing in skill in the aerosol prediction. And you see a similar trend in the ozone prediction. Um, as uh, uh, computed uh, with independent observations. And you see that uh, actually the real time has improved substantially and it's now like of similar quality to reanalysis. And here we have also a picture of uh, simulated uh, CAMS uh, um, um, carbon monoxide versus uh, Sentinel 5P observations. And you would be uh, probably st uh, stricken by the how 
similar these uh, two plots are. So what's going on now? So there's been a, a progressive move from NWP um, towards a, a very complex uh, model with the atmospheric constituents integrated with the weather model. And now there is a, a sort of moving in the opposite direction, which is work in progress, because we want to see what we can um, take from um, the developments in atmospheric composition and bring back to use in the weather in the numerical weather prediction model. I'll show you some examples, and this is part of the new vision for 2025. ACMWF has the ambition to uh, produce uh, um, forecasts with high fidelity up to one year ahead, so uh, pushing somehow the, the boundaries, and um, also incorporating an increased level of complexity in uh, chemical processes and physical processes, and also uh, looking at the whole um, Earth system uh, modeling, so including atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, and land, and composition. And then also, of course, a part of the mission is delivering uh, timely and reliable environmental information. So that's... Uh, so uh, how can atmospheric composition help uh, uh, then weather? For example, uh, we can use the atmospheric composition information to build better climatologies. And this is an example from... Um, a recent work uh, by Alessio Bozzo and Johannes Fleming. Um, they constructed a, a new aerosol climatology to be used um, in the uh, ECMWF operational model, and it's been used since 2016. And you can see that uh, looking at uh, um, independent data, uh, uh, Aronet uh, uh, observations, you see that the new climatology in red uh, follows better the observations, and um, it's more representative of the state of the aerosols than the old climatology uh, which is in green. So this has an impact in the um, uh, prediction of the winds. And we see that at day five, so five day forecast, um, the wind bias at 925 hectopascal in the um, uh, Indian Ocean region is greatly reduced thanks to this improved aerosol climatology. And there is also uh, higher consistency between the aerosols because this climatology is derived from the prognostic aerosols that are in the CMWF model. Another example is uh, this um, fire uh, from Siberia and Canada which uh, were very intense from 2017. And um, um, the, uh, again, Alessio Bozzo and Mark Parrington at ECMWF, they performed a study to investigate the radiative impact of the uh, smoke in the uh, ECMWF model. And they showed that uh, there, were, uh, there were several watt per meter square um, of differences between um, uh, in the top of the atmosphere, net shortwave anomaly, and they were corresponding to the passage of the smoke. And this was uh, particularly evident over the Arctic area where uh, the majority of the smoke was concentrated. So again, we see another example of uh, impact of the aerosols at the medium range. Uh, here uh, we look at the stratospheric ozone, and um, at the moment stratospheric ozone is not interactive with the, the radiation, but when we use it interactively in the radiation scheme, um, ozone, um, a better description of ozone has the potential to affect the stratospheric temperatures and uh, in return winds. And uh, there is uh, um, generally an improvement. There is also areas in which uh, this is not, uh, it's not all good news. However, it is very important to continue exploring this potential and understand better the impact of aerosols, um, particularly with more recent uh, model versions. And this is work in progress. And now moving like in the, in the range, now we're looking at subseasonal sub range. And these are some studies that I performed together with Frederic Vitar at ECMWF, summarized in a monthly weather review paper. Um, we ran um, two control runs and one run with the prognostic aerosols. The two control runs had um, the old climatology from Tegen, um, 1997, in the radiation. The second control had the newest um, uh, climatolo climatology, and the, the pro prognostic uh, experiment had interactive aerosols, uh, fully prognostic and interactive with the radiation. And uh, only the direct effect was considered. And what's presented here is um, 
what they are, are known as scorecards. I don't know how many of you are familiar with those, but uh, these are a synthetic way to assess the impact of a new configuration of the model on the on this, uh, prediction. And you see a list of uh, uh, variables, temperature, surface temperature, sea surface temperature, uh, wind um, at various levels in the atmosphere. And if it's um, blue or light blue, it means that the uh, control the experiment with the prognostic arrows or, or with the modification, in this case the prognostic arrows perform better than the control. And in both cases, for both controls, you have a significant impact and a significant improvement in the representation of the uh, several meteorological parameters at uh, um, week two and, and four, so at the, you know, like at the range of the uh, monthly subseasonal forecasting range. And this is due to an interaction of the also with the madden julian oscillation. So there is um, the physical mechanism behind this has been identified, being the madden, madden julian oscillation. Um, we also looked at extreme events uh, with those runs, and we looked at the Indonesian fires of 2015, and um, you have on one panel on the left, you have like the fire rate at the power from August to October 2015. That was a very um, unusual season, incre incredibly strong uh, fires in Indonesia that affected the air quality of the whole region for um, several months. And actually, in the runs that we performed that were extended up to six months, we were able to predict the cooling due to smoke six months ahead. And that was uh, because we uh, prescribed observed emissions. So of course, we had you know, the advantage of knowing that there was going to be a lot of smoke. However, if we, if we can develop a, um, a predictive fire dynamical model, given that this type of fires have high, very high predictive, uh, predictability, and also they are connected to El Nino, we think that there is potential to actually identify this type of events uh, six months ahead, or a, a season ahead. Um, again, talking about seasonal prediction, the impact of sulfur aerosol. This plot is from Tim, uh, Tim Stockdale, who has uh, looked at the impact of uh, um, stratospheric aerosols on the uh, temperature response in, um, of the seasonal forecast system. And if you don't prescribe correctly the vertical profile of the aerosols, um, you, uh, your temperature response is wrong. And you have the ERA interim curve in blue, which is you know, the reference. And uh, the uh, CIS, um, in that case, it was system four in red. And you see that uh, after a few months, because of the lack of correct prescription of uh, volcanic aerosols, the temperature response is wrong. And uh, he also looked at the impact of uh, ozone at the seasonal range, and again, um, here you have like a plot of uh, skill score, and uh, the higher the better. You have various configuration. Uh, you have persistence in black, which is actually, luckily, <laughs> the, the uh, one that performs the worst. And then you have uh, uh, system four and system five with the climatological ozone, which com um, perform comparatively. And then in blue, you have the system five, which is the most recent version of the seasonal uh, system at ECMWF with interactive ozone. And you see that in the skill is increased. So there's uh, like uh, uh, quite um, um, a good news, you know, like definitely something to keep researching. And then uh, I want to just highlight uh, new frontiers in atmospheric composition data simulation, which is also part of the development that is going on at ACMWF. Uh, we know the atmospheric composition is driven by emission and surface fluxes. And uh, embedding emissions flux, fluxes in the uh, data simulation formulation is the new frontier for development. Because if you can estimate the emission fluxes based on observations, then your uh, prediction of the composition fields will definitely be improved. And at the moment, we have uh, the uh, CO2 human emission, emission project, um, which is uh, uh, funded by Horizon 2020. And as a mission, it has to, um, to, uh, would like to build the capability for monitoring CO2 anthropogenic emissions. So that's uh, um, the new frontier. And then um, all these examples that I have mentioned to you and uh, all this thinking about what uh, atmospheric composition can bring to um, 
weather prediction has been uh, summarized in a document um, by uh, my colleague uh, Rossana Dragani and um, it's uh, to understand what are the priority developments for, um, that are useful for NWP forecasting up to a season. And uh, um, as I mentioned, the aim is to understand what level of complexity we need and what are the most important uh, uh, processes that we need to describe. Um, so here's some summaries and future perspectives. So um, I think I don't need to convince this audience that atmospheric composition is uh, an integral and important part of the uh, Earth system. So we need to um, model it. Um, an accurate uh, numerical weather prediction model with physical and chemical processes and realistic emissions offer what I would say the perfect framework to model atmospheric composition. Uh, in return, some elements of the atmospheric comp composition can improve the weather forecast at various scales and the interaction mechanisms are different and depend on the species that you're considering. The degree of complexity of air quality that is needed for NWP may depend on the specific application. So we cannot prescribe a general recipe that fits everybody. But obviously, uh, more research is needed in that sense. And then I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, um, it's uh, thanks to observations, satellite observations and ground-based network observations, such as those provided by um, the Global Atmosphere Watch program, that are key to really advance in modeling and prediction of atmospheric composition and also understand better the impacts of uh, an on the NWP. So thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you for your very interesting presentation, and we already have a starting queue for questions. Oops, I'm too short, hello. Hi, so very, very quick question. So you have shown your quite impressive improvement in your uh, subseasonal scale um, skills when you add your atmos atmospheric composition. I was wondering if you have looked at it in more details at the region of the Asian monsoon to understand if there is a sp special improvement there. Uh, I have another question um, that is related to the improvement in the seasonal forecast, so the quasi-biennial oscillation, the, the Tim, Stick, uh, Tim Stockdale figure that you have shown. If you have investigated more in details about the mechanism by which when you have an interactive ozone, you may improve this, uh, this skill. And finally, in your figure where, where you have the, 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 the biases uh, into the southern hemisphere, and you have said that you have some worsening into the higher part of the atmosphere when you have an interactive ozone. If this is related instead to a response of the dynamics of the stratosphere, probably initiated higher up into the mesosphere or something like this. Thanks. All right. Thanks. So I'll start from the uh, first one. So we did look at uh, regions, and in fact, yes, there was uh, quite a big regional um, impact in the, in the subseasonal system, particularly in the area of the Indian Ocean, which is interesting, was the area where the new climatology had also provided improvements. So that was interesting because it was a confirmation that that area, the old climatology, was not describing the aerosol fields appropriately. But of course, in the interactive aerosol run, you have feedbacks, because you, the, uh, the aerosols impact the radiation, the radiation impacts the vertical structure and the winds, and so for, particularly for aerosols that are mechanically produced, like dust, you have an impact on the emissions. So it's actually uh, something that we still need to uh, understand more, but we could really see that there was a strong impact of the, the MJO, uh, depending on the phase, on uh, the aerosol amounts on the anomalies in the aerosol amounts. So we really think that there is something physical there at play. And that's why we think that prognostic aerosols are the best way to look at, into that, because you have the feedback mechanism all in place, at least the direct. You know. and, Yes, regarding the, uh, the ozone, actually, um, I, if I remember correctly from what Tim explained to me when he presented those results, it was coming from the fact that um, the, uh, the current model had a bias. The, the representation of the ozone um, was done by a model which had like a, uh, a small bias. So I think that you see that differential response because with the improved version of the model, some of the bias was addressed, but not all of it. So I think it's more like uh, really depends on the ozone model that's underlying 
rather than, well, I'm sure that you're right that it's also the interaction with the dynamics in the stratosphere. But if I remember from what he was telling me, it was really, um, it was uh, depending on what type of aerosol model he was using for the stratosphere and the biases that that model had. And when he used the newer one, it was addressing some of the problems in the uh, middle of the stratosphere. Um, and so, in fact, you saw the improvement and that was better, but that model was slightly biased uh, in total column. So you had probably the degradation and the upper stratosphere was coming from that. But yeah, okay, and I hope that was. Uh, <laughs> Is there another question? Yeah, Alexander. Thanks, Angela, for a nice uh, overview of the studies. Um, my question is about uh, how to link uh, GAO observation system and modeling community. What modeling community expect and how the GAO observation system can do some steps for a more efficient use of uh, uh, data of GAO for evaluation, uh, for example, uh, ECMWF is already doing and also in future for uh, data simulation. And of course, these steps, I suppose, should be from both sides. Yes. Um, in fact, you know, my, my talk uh, um, was not focusing on that, but I wanted to put a picture of the verification that we do with GAO data, because that's um, for ozone and for reactive gases is more established, but, but for uh, aerosols, it's just been uh, put in place, and it's going to become operational soon, in the next few months. So we are using GAO data for now, mainly for verification, but uh, um, also for model development and uh, understanding processes. I just showed you like a small example of you know verification, but even behind that there is a lot of work and collaboration. And uh, I think you know um, the mechanisms are in place because the communities are talking, and that's the most important thing. So the uh, modeling community is talking to the uh, people uh, providing the measurements, uh, and Go actually has been instrumental in that because, for example, I'm a modeler uh, by background, but I am in the scientific uh, advisory group for aerosols uh, for Go. So, you know, like I actually get to hear a lot about the measurements and how they are made. And, you know, so I, I get to appreciate more, you know, like the observations. And but then I also bring my perspective, which is that of a global model. So, you know, we can make use of certain, you know, like observations and uh, maybe not others due to maybe our limitations. But I really think that uh, Go is fostering this dialogue and I can only hope it continues because it has uh, proven very uh, powerful, this continuous dialogue between different communities. Also Marco, uh, Marco this morning, uh, earlier this morning was encouraging not to uh, proceed separately but to integrate, you know, also integrate in different uh, uh, atmospheric constituents. So far we have uh, maybe operated a little bit, uh, you know, in compartments. So, but uh, as we see, it's all connected. So we need to also be connected uh, among each other, modelers, uh, data providers, and also people doing different, I don't know, greenhouse gases or aerosols, and we should talk more together. Okay, thank you very much, Angela, and everybody else from this session. And before, before you now all run away, before we start the coffee break, we would also like to acknowledge the photos that we have seen during the questions, um, which were submitted by different Global Atmosphere Watch stations in the framework of the 30th anniversary. And one station also submitted a video, which we will now have a look at. And after that, we would get back to the questions that were asked before the lunch break to the Scientific Steering Committee. So if you can wait a little bit more, that would be awesome.
Ah, there it is. It was just to increase the um, excitement. <laughs> Okay, and now let's come to the questions that were asked to the Scientific Steering Committee via the Mentimeter. So I welcome back our first speaker of today, Greg Carmichael, the chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of Global Atmosphere Watch. <laughs> and maybe we start with one of my favorite questions, which fits very well to the video we've just seen. Do you have fun while working? Yes, we do, right? You can see from that, yeah. So it's a great experience working with the Global Atmospheric Watch, and I know in the audience many of you are doing so. And those that have an interest in, in joining the fun, please see us afterwards. Um, are there any plans to increase the program? Well, we're always, uh, our, one of our primary goals is to increase the observing system. Uh, we talked about that. Earlier today, we're going to talk about it again, a splinter meeting on Wednesday. Uh, you know, there's lots of measurements being taken out of there, uh, taking around the world, but there's lots of spots in the world where uh, we're lacking parameters or some observations. And, and we heard from uh, Marco uh, Kumala uh, about the need for and the vision for, you know, the thousand new stations uh, that would really help us uh, better manage the planet. So, uh, yes, that's one vision that we have. Uh, one question was about the sustainability, or several questions were about the sustainability of observations. For that, I would direct everybody to our splinter, meter, splinter meeting tomorrow evening on sustainability of observations in emerging economies, 19 in the evening. And we also have flyers there where all the details are. May I just comment on that? Uh, we heard from Angela that, I mean, one way that uh, the, we're heading the future is this uh, more intimate use of predictability and observations. And uh, I think as we see more and more observations being used in operations, uh, then the argument for and the need for and the sustainability for those measurements, I think, will, in, will be, at least the opportunities will be enhanced. Uh, yeah. And there were also questions about how to share the data and how people could contribute. Yeah, sharing data is, uh, is a huge issue. Certainly WMO's uh, policy is open and shared data. You know, I think from the satellite community that's been a, a practice. I think in terms of the surface-based observations, uh, especially of atmospheric composition, that becomes uh, a little more complicated because as we talked this morning, a lot of that data falls outside of the weather services or uh, belongs privately or is held by a company. And so I think we need to <clears throat> make uh, further strides in doing that. But I'm very happy to see, you know, just a week ago we were at uh, CMA in China and we see an opening of the policy of sharing data. I think, again, as people see the use of the data and how everyone benefits, uh, uh, that uh, will continue to grow. But I think it's something we have to be vigilant on and work within our organizations. <clears throat> yeah. 
And people also wanted to know how you convince the politicians. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody give, give me the answer to that and I'd, uh, I'd be a, a, a better person. But no, I'd, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I think we'd have to, from an atmospheric composition perspective, I think, you know, we're, air pollution at the, you know, is still uh, in everybody's mind. They can see it. They're impacted by it. That's a very strong motivator. Uh, so I think that uh, the future as we articulate that and as we get closer to providing uh, additional services, uh, I think that uh, the value of what we're doing hopefully will be realized. And there were questions about further collaborations, for example, how Gore could closer collaborate with IGAC and ILEAPS? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, again, uh, we are a community of atmospheric scientists, atmospheric chemists, uh, engineers. We share a very common interest. We want to do research and we want to see the research have impact. I think these organizations, uh, uh, many people belong to all three of these or organizations or two of them. Uh, and so we, we are working closely together. I think uh, in my dream it would be that we could uh, have more uh, co-designed activities and then also on certain issues uh, speak with a, with a single voice and maybe our voice would be louder and heard more uh, effectively. So things like, you know, we have very common interest in, in preserving and increasing uh, opportunities for research, capacity to building, uh, those sorts of things. So. I think we just have to keep working uh, together and finding ways to, to speak louder. And there were also some questions about the observing network. So what about satellite observations, if we plan to include mobile networks, and um, if there are any VOC observations? What was the last part? If there are VOC observations, volatile organic compounds observations. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 uh, we need. Uh, I mean, certainly I think the satellite is a community that, uh, you know, certainly is advancing as community speaks strongly together. I think the Global Atmospheric Watch program is integrating more and more the uh, satellite observations. Uh, we've had a, a working group uh, expert team working on uh, the rolling review of requirements, including satellites, and uh, Richard Eichmann from NASA is just taking over the leadership of that activity. We see all these you know, tremendous assets coming online, uh, though, and also those being planned to the latest uh, decadal survey. We see the suborbital platforms and their capabilities uh, you know, being a more integral part of, of those. Uh, so I think at that scale, um, we're going to, you know, it's going to be a super exciting time. Um, and I think at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the, the low cost sensors, uh, the need for information uh, at higher spatial temporal resolution and at the personal kind of control of the observations and ownership awareness, I think that's, you know, that's happening and exciting. I think uh, we'll see how we can use it over the next uh, a few years and decades of how that will find its way into more science-based analysis, uh, but I think it's exciting. And certainly we have reactive gas uh, group has been measuring uh, hydrocarbons, that's an important component. But as we learned from an uh, atmospheric chemistry perspective, we heard a great talk uh, earlier in this session, the more information we have on uh, speciated hydrocarbons, uh, understanding its reactivity, are just really critical for evolving our understanding of, you know, the atmospheric chemistry, but we, we see its applications and uses. We're learning new things all the time by measurements like that, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions from the room to Greg or any comments from people from the Global Atmosphere Watch community or others which they would like to share? Well, if not, I just want to thank uh, uh, everybody that contributes to atmospheric chemistry research and those that contribute to uh, the Global Atmospheric Watch. Yeah. Oh, we have a question coming. Um, I thought yeah, you no, were the no, birthday, no, right? <laughs> so I, I was just uh, surprised by this uh, very nice video, which we just saw. I was part of it. 
Uh, what I really like about working for Global Atmosphere Watch, I've been working now for 20 years, uh, it's really exciting and uh, it's, it's really nice to see that uh, the data uh, that is produced, that it is used, it's involving and it's important for society. I think that's yeah. really, really important. So yeah. happy birthday again, yeah. Global Atmosphere Watch. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with this, we can close the session and wish go a happy birthday again and go to the coffee break. <laughs> so happy birthday. <laughs>